here's a message of importance to millions of people who are continually pale and washed out, weak and run down. Doctors will tell you that these conditions are often caused by a deficiency of iron. The iron you need to keep you physically fit and mentally alert. Studies show that two out of three women and many, many men lack the daily iron your body requires in a form your body can easily use and put to work. gives you more than your daily minimum iron requirement. So if you're not getting the iron your body needs... down and are easily upset, start taking today. TGIF, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Have No Sphere right here on the Iron Real Media YouTube channel. My name is Josh Corey, and man, we have got a show that uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, hold on to the edge of your seats, though, because this is going to be one you will not want to miss. Uh, before we get into it, let's jump right in and say hello to the panelists. Everybody that's joined us today, we'll start off with Mr. John Savage, since I've not spoken to him yet today. John, how's your week been, sir? Hi, Josh. Hey, everyone. Yeah, it's um, been a week. Another one gone. Kids now finished school. Apparently, they're starting back at school in September. Um Wife went into work for the first time since March today. So, and once again, I've been dicking about with bicycle brakes. So, yeah, looking forward to a um, bit of time off to listen tonight and um, catch up on this it, hugely interesting story from what from what I gather. But um, yeah, how have you been, Josh? Oh, I've been pretty good. Work's going really, really well. I've been asked to uh, get certified in the handling of liquid nitrogen so that uh, I can continue to build some of these uh, interesting units they've got coming into work. All these cool little prototype things that the military is sending us to build to test out. Um, I'm telling you, it's uh, stuff they think come up with is pretty interesting. But there's going to be so much force that they really want to keep these boxes held together so the pins I use have to be shrunk. And then you fit them in there, and as they warm back up, they'll expand and they'll fit real snug. But uh, we've tried dry ice, but dry ice only got down to about a negative 170 degrees uh, French. So that wasn't cold enough to shrink the pin enough to get it to fit into the hole. So it looks like we're going to need liquid nitrogen. We cannot get it down beyond negative 500. And I think liquid nitrogen goes to about 490 something. So I guess uh, that'll work. So I bet um, Walt, Walt could do with a bit of negative 500 at the moment. How are you doing, Walt? I bet he could. How the hell are you doing, Walter? I understand it's probably pretty warm it's down there where you are. It's a bit warm here. Yes, yes. I oh, you just muted yourself. That was nifty. The sun seems to be going behind the clouds. We're going to get a bit of rain, but yeah, the rain will just make it more humid once it cools it off on a tiny bit. So rather than me drawing on about the weather, we have an incredible show, and I don't want to drag on with my crap. I will say this, though, Josh. 
Jerry warned us in emails that we might have electronic issues today with trying to present this information because in the past he's had issues with presenting this information. I took, it took me like five restarts of the app. To, I saw us live, but there was still no show streaming on YouTube for like the first minute and a half. So I finally see Baldini and it's in there and it's starting to get right. But there was something going on at the beginning for sure that wasn't kosher. So hi, hi. <laughs> now move on and say hey to Mr. Sack and we will get to our guest. Okay, let's do that. Without much further ado, let's say hello to Mr. Zachary Zabala, Z squared, or you may know him right here on YouTube as Good Times for All, spelled G U D T I M S, the number four A double L. <laughs> Zach, how's your week been? I understand you got some exciting things for us this evening. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, found out that Maxwell's equations are somewhat fraudulent which really put my mind at ease because <laughs> I've been trying to figure out how certain things were working and yeah, it's all better now. But, um, no, yeah, I've started freezing magnets via Ken Wheeler, the Aurea Apophysis here on YouTube, make some beautiful designs with these magnets suspended in water. It creates this egg shape around it that freezes slower than the rest of it. It's just gorgeous. And I've got one. I'm ready to open here sometime during the show. We'll see how it goes. It might be at the end. I don't know. I'm, I've been waiting. It's been like Christmas for the last 48 hours. I've been waiting to open this thing to see what happens. And I did a few of them already. Got a crazy result where I got water to flash freeze and a two-inch spire <laughs> sticking up out of the, the cup. Yeah, just insane stuff. Um, something I probably will never be able to recreate again. Did you get photos of that, Zach? Yeah, 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 I did. I actually put them on a uh, a thing for tonight's show, showing how I was gonna. Yeah, when I open this, it should be perfectly clear, and then all of a sudden, as soon as the atmosphere disturbs it, it'll flash freeze all at once. So you're you live on air. Design. You're going to open it to the, the open the freezer tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. that. Sounds good. But yeah. I am really excited for our guests. So we will definitely postpone that till probably the end. Um, yeah, this is going to be awesome. I'm really excited. So yeah, I'm let's get rolling. Let's get rolling. Well, just cause I'm a lazy host, I'm going to do this the easy way right here. Jerry Marzinski prior to retirement, Jerry was a licensed psychotherapist. He has over 35 years of experience working with schizophrenic and other psychiatric patients in state hospitals, state prisons, and hospital emergency rooms. Jerry's formal academic training comprises of a BA in psychology from Temple University, a master's degree in counseling from the University of Georgia, and two years of study in a PhD psychology program. He held the position of a second lieutenant in the Arizona Civil Air Patrol and the assistant scout master. He's a licensed commercial pilot and a certified scuba diver since 1972. In his spare time, he flies glider planes and enjoys cross-country motorcycle trips with his friends. He's an avid explorer of nature, non-physical phenomena, and spiritual development. He enjoys travel, hiking, camping, welding, riding, shooting, gardening, and DIY projects. Ladies and gentlemen, the John Constantine of paranoid schizophrenic, the Elliot Ness of the psychiatric medical mafia, Mr. Jerry Marzinski. Jerry, thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you, and I am so looking forward to what you have to share with us this evening. It's, it's interesting you guys have uh, such a technical background because I usually usually you're blessed with one or the other and not both. <laughs> my my uh, co-author Sherry is like that. She's a you know, civil engineer, but yet she's she's one of the most spiritually advanced people I know at the same time, which is a real odd combination. So she's got her foot in both worlds. I'm not as mathematically and I love science, but I hate math. <laughs> Probably would have been an electrical engineer if I knew math, or if I was good with math, but I always hated math. Um, but that kind of pushed me over, way over to 
the small part of the normal curve. Uh, and the best combination between the two was psychology, which was supposed to be some science and some math. And the only real science to it was um, experimental psychology. But what I learned in college and graduate school never prepared me for the front lines um, and what was happening there. So after I finished finished graduate school, even before I got there, what I hated about psychology is, except for experimental, there was no way to check out what they were saying. Here's these books and books and books saying all this stuff, but you didn't have access to a clinical population. I didn't have access to a clinical population until I I was in the master's uh, program, and even then it it was very limited. So you have to take it on faith. You have to much. take it on faith. And, and the way I was raised is I I don't trust authorities as far as I can throw them. And I had that hammered into my head by incident after incident after incident. So it, it, it really bothered me in undergraduate site where I couldn't see what was going on. I had to take their word for it. And then you, you look in the back of the book and here's – this guy, and here's this whole list of professors, and, and this guy got the information from this guy who got it from this guy who got it from this guy who got it from this guy, and and very few of them were on the out on the front lines. You know, they were they were academics, and later I found out that ninety percent of what psychology publishes is not reputable, and that's across the entire spectrum of, of academic site. And one of their rules is publish or perish. So they would just publish all kinds of things. You know, just anything that they, they would they could get published, they would publish it. And somebody tried to replicate it, and there was no way. They, they couldn't because it was garbage. Uh, and I, I learned that uh, when I was in the PhD program. It, it was, you know, they wanted you to do a research program, and, and the fellow I was working for, the professor I was working for, he, he said, well, don't, you don't need to do anything novel or new. Just just repeat this this same uh, experiment and then just cast your vote among all the others, either yay or nay. So that's all you got to do. Just get it published. And what? What? And, and there was another time that this was real telling where um, so I was a graduate assistant and running uh, a group with master's level students. And the professor I was working for one day decided, you know, well, well I want to come in and see what you're doing. So I thought, fine, come on in. We came in and, and one student asked me a question I didn't know the answer to. And so I just said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you there. I don't have an answer. I don't know that. And uh, after the group, the professor said, I want to see you right now. You come to my, come down to my office right now. And like, what, what did I do? And I kind of walk down there with him and sit down. And he looks at me and goes, don't you ever tell a student you don't know the answer to a question again. And I'm like, what? You know, then my, my head just, what are you talking about? I didn't know the answer. I told him the truth. Well, you just tell him you'll find out and then go find something. You find out. You know, you know. So the perception of, it was very important that they, taught the perception, how, how you are perceived. Because it, it was like a game. It, it, it's like, it's more important how you're perceived than the truth. You know, so that was my first, my first warning there. But as, you know, as I was going through undergraduate school, uh, when I hit abnormal psychology, I just lit up. I mean, it was like, wow, why is this happening to these people? What's going on with them? What is this mental illness? Why why are they so so crazy and uncontrollable? What, you know, and it was like, and then you'd go through, and this happened to everybody. You know, well, I see that in me, and yeah, I see that in me too, and that, and everybody had all these mental illnesses that they had listed there. You know, you could see aspects in it, everybody who was taking the course. But as as we went further, I remember there was one time where they assigned us to read a research article done by a psychologist, and, and this was before I had any clinical experience at all. Uh, and the article basically said if, if two crazy people with the same delusion ran into each other, one of them would have to change their delusion to something else. And I'm like, well, why would they have to do that? They're two, they're 
two crazy nuts, and why would one of them have to logically change so the other one could be whatever he was, and then that other guy changed to something else? It just didn't make any sense. And so there was no way for me to verify it. So I just logged it in. I mean, it was something I never forgot. I'm, I'm kind of thinking, well, one day I'll be able to check this out. So fast forward, maybe, let me see, what would it be? Probably another seven years, maybe five, seven years. I was on, uh, I was doing rounds on one of the psych units at Central State Hospital, which at that time was the largest psychiatric hospital on the planet. When I got there, I think there were like 12,000 patients down from about 26,000. Uh, it, it was a, an ocean of insanity. I mean, just every mental illness that you could possibly imagine was there. And I was an adrenaline junkie. And for me, with a, a burning interest in having on the site, that was like a candy store. I mean, I was like loose in a candy store. And I had no idea what was going on, but it was, a, you know, I was bent on finding out. So uh, one day I ran into this one fellow, and I was, I was on the second floor of the psych unit, and a new patient appeared, and he was walking around talking to himself. You could hear he's carrying on a conversation. It was like uh, listening into one side of a telephone conversation. You could hear what he said, but you couldn't hear the voice that he was responding to. And he's walking around carrying this conversation and arguing with whatever it was he was hearing. And I crept up behind him, and, and you could actually hear. It wasn't word salad. It, 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 it wasn't just random words. There, there was actually like conversation flowing between him and whatever he was talking to. And whatever he was talking to was answering him back, and there was a coherent conversation going on. Um, so I listened to that for a while, and then he saw me. And um, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Jerry. I'm, I'm you know, the counselor on this unit and uh, just haven't seen you before. I just wanted to introduce myself and see who you were. And I said, oh, what's your name? And he looks at me and he goes, uh, I'm Jesus Christ. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I said, no, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am. <laughs> and I stood there and I go, okay, let's see what happens here. You know? <laughs> Let me see if what that professor wrote was, was correct. And he, he's puzzled. He's kind of looking around and like thinking. And, he's going, mm -hmm. and then he looks up at me and goes, okay, we can both be Jesus. And then he turns around and walks off. <laughs> nice. Okay, that's number one. What else they lied to me about? And, and uh, another one came up uh, later. It was one where... They were, what the site manual was saying, what the, what the textbooks were saying, that schizophrenics were just way too um, uncoordinated, un unable to, to organize themselves, or way too disorganized to um, perform any detailed behavior or, or, or track detailed objectives and, and do objective detailed planning. And uh, from the schizophrenics I saw at that time, up to that time, that was that was pretty true. You know, if they're in the state hospital, they weren't doing that. Um, but there was this this one unit where a friend of mine worked who had the same position I did on one of the psych units. Um, I went over to visit him one day, and, and they they didn't have the best psychiatrist at the state hospital. And most of them came from Cuba, or they were you know, kind of couldn't get jobs anywhere else. Um, and I was visiting my friend in his office, and, and uh, as we were leaving, I saw this guy dressed like Sigmund Freud. He had a, a pipe like Sigmund Freud, he had a beard like Sigmund Freud, he, could, he, he smoked it, and just like Sigmund Freud, he was dressed in a sport coat. And I, I, looked, at, I looked at Ed and I said, who is that? He goes, well, that's our psychiatrist, man. <laughs> I went, God, that's, you know, we called him Freud. He said, well, it is bad. And uh, you know, several months later, um, he calls me and he, he goes, uh, hey, uh, you, you come on over here, hurry up. This, you, you, I got something to show you before it disappears. So you, you get over here. And he said, don't waste time. Get over here. So I run over to his psych unit and, and we go into this psychiatrist's office. And in the middle of his desk is this pile of feces that's shaped like a pipe. 
But what I found out had happened is that one of the psychiatrist's patients who didn't like his medicines and didn't like him, at three in the morning, somehow got out of his room, went down three floors past three attendance stations that were supposed to be manned on them, somehow figured out how to break into the psychiatrist's office, got up on his desk, squatted on his desk, took a crap, shaped it into a pipe, and then escaped from the hospital, never to be seen again. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm he did not there. like that guy. <laughs> no, no. And matter of fact, they, psychiatrists were assaulted at a rate higher than any other staff at the hospital other than attendants who were there full time. So here was the, the second thing that they, they taught me in school, like, well, psychiatrists are, or psych, so psychiatrists are too disorganized to, to do complex planning. But this guy got somehow got through three attendance stations, figured out a way to break into that psychiatrist's office, crap on his desk, take the time to shape it into a pipe, and then somehow got out of the a, a, a locked psychiatric room probably through the psychiatrist's window, I would assume. They never found him. So here's, an, here's another one. So yeah, here's that took some planning. That, yeah. that took some planning to do. It took some planning and execution and, and to be quiet enough to break into the office without being noticed. I mean, even is if that, it's three, Is that but, something you saw again? I know I've read a few books over the years where, like, different patients will almost acquire a skill set they'd never had before. If that makes any sense, like being able to sneak around in a building and get in a guy's office and crap on his desk and escape all of a sudden, that kind of thing, or speaking a language that they had no access to from some other country or just different things like that. Well, you know, I've heard of that, but I've, I've never witnessed it. And um, it, 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 I mean, it has happened according to a number of the people, but for what the voices are about and what their agenda is, if if the person doesn't understand that language, they won't be around for long. They're, they are, um, see, psychiatry calls them hallucinations. They insist they're hallucinations. They haven't done a single study on them. If uh, patients have been trying to tell them for hundreds of years, these things are very real, and they just, they just blow them off. They won't listen to them at all. Wouldn't a halluc- if it was hallucinogenic, that would require some type of chemical yeah, in the body, these, and well, it should be able to be tracked, right? Like, okay, these people that are having this have a high content of this being produced from this certain area or gland, or yeah, they haven't, no- they haven't been able to find anything. Uh, wow. it, what, what they did this is they. They have to give the appearance like they know what's going on. And so they always drum up some cause. But the truth is they have no idea at all what causes. So it's a religion. Change. It's pretty much a religion. Well, it's a psychiatric, have, psychiatric yeah. religion. Yeah, they have to have an answer for everything, and right. they just go with it. So, they, yeah, they started off with mothers. They, they go, you know, psychosis is, is due to mothers. They did something wrong. Uh, they raised the kid wrong. Um, you know, so they, they blamed it on, on mothers. And then they, they couldn't find anything there. So they began blaming it on, uh, what else was it? There was genetics they came up with. So they, they couldn't find a gene, a schizophrenia gene. So you know, what they were doing was moving from things that were observable, you know, by the average guy, you know, so where the general population could see that that wasn't true from their own experiences, you know, like mothers doing something or uh, um, you know, eating certain foods or, I mean, the observable things that the general population could see and check out for themselves into the areas of science where they couldn't check them out. So then they moved into genetics where the average guy had no access to that kind of information. And they were saying, oh, yeah, there's a, it's, a, it's a genetic cause or we believe it's a genetic cause. Um, now, then when they couldn't find a, a gene for schizophrenia, then they went, oh, well, then it's, a, it's, a, it's not a simple thing. It's a, it's a combination of all these millions of genes that work together. But they had no proof for that. It just looked good, but they, they had a cause. The most devious and deceptive of the bunch was their chemical imbalance theory 
for, for the first 10 years after see, the drug companies want you to think they're spending billions of dollars in research in these, in these drugs that they're producing. Antipsychotics were found by accident in a drug lab in Europe. It wasn't a drug lab, it was a dye lab where they were finding dyes to dye fabrics with. And then the, the staff started getting worked out by whatever they were working on. And whatever that was, they extracted it. And they were using it for operations and, and all kinds of other stuff. And um, then somebody went, uh, hey, this might, be, this might work to calm down uh, psychiatric patients. Because um, what they were doing before, um, the, the history of psychiatry is, is horrible. And this was the first thing they had that actually worked. Let me see if I can get that. Jerry, my my dad was a psychiatrist, and from what I can gather, they they gave him a book every year or every few years that you basically look up the symptoms, and it tells you which petroleum-based pharmaceutical to try them on. And from what I can tell from personal, not personal experience, but personal family experience, that that's exactly the same as today. They, they, I mean, they're even prescribing lithium, which seems to have gone through the roof recently. But is it is it still the same same way? You you're given this book, and it's is it the DM? I can't remember. DSM five. DSM. Now. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So what they did now, it, it's. None, not a single diagnosis in that DSM, and I think it's uh, to 297 now. They come up with new psychiatric illnesses every year. So it's a group of psychiatrists that get together and meet. What I've heard is three quarters of them are tied up with the pharmaceutical industry. So they make up these diagnoses, they put down these symptoms, and then the pharmaceutical industry follows up with all these chemicals saying they treat those symptoms. And they put it out and they advertise it. And then six months later, you see, you know, the lawyers on TV saying, oh, yeah, if any of you who've tried these things and are sick from them, um, you know, join this class action lawsuit, we're going to sue, you know, one of the drug companies. But the first ones that come up with that, uh, that idea that, that mental illness was a chemical imbalance in the brain was Eli Lilly back in the 70s when they came out with Prozac. So they knew at the time that there was no evidence that Prozac fixed any kind of chemical imbalance. Matter of fact, they had no way to measure any kind of chemical imbalance in the patient's brain. They just went, well, this is a chemical. For the first 10 years after any psychotic drugs came out, major tranquilizers, they had no idea why they worked. So they were brought over Prozac. from Europe. Prozac was, is it's an antidepressant, and it's basically fluoride, isn't it, or a derivative of fluoride? Um, a friend of mine was on it because he was depressed, and he read the insert, and it said may cause depression, <laughs> and may cause suicidal tendencies, and yeah. this, that, and the other. And it was like, what the hell are they putting you on that for? I mean, it's just utter madness, isn't it? It's like chemotherapy for cancer. It's just utter madness. Well, j just on antipsychotics alone, they're making $3.7 billion a year. Jeez. And these things don't cure anything. It doesn't cure anything. It merely suppresses psychotic symptoms. It doesn't get rid of the voices. It doesn't cure anything. And it's super expensive. Or exacerbates the symptoms. I was about to ask, doesn't it sometimes make the symptoms worse? That's why they keep playing the switch game on, oh, well, let's try this, and let's try that. Now, during your uh, studies, did they ever teach you what they did before all this stuff was out there? Oh, yeah. I've heard. Yeah, I can tell you what they did before they did out there. You know, that started off back in uh, ancient Egypt where they started drilling holes in the, in the head of these guys to blot out evil spirits. But it, it worked sometime when there was pressure on the brain. It, it you know, occasionally worked. But it, where it all started was in 375 BC with Hippocrates, where he came up basically saying there's a physical cause for all illnesses. 
and, and he followed that that path and and he you know there's germs and you know boil the water and that kind of stuff and it, it, it looked pretty solid so doctors based their philosophy on hypocrisies so uh we're back in uh, that that drilling of the hole in the head uh, you know that was they were drilling holes in the head and in, in, in 4, 1488 um, ad they were drilling holes in, in the head in 17, 1790, they came up, a uh, French upholster came out with the straitjacket. So basically what they were doing is they had insane asylums and they needed some way to control these massive populations of insane people because it, it, it's like a zoo in there. And it, with, before before drugs came out, I was talking to attendants to, where they had these major battles with psychiatric patients. When people got hurt, they got seriously hurt. The attendants got hurt, the patients got hurt. Jerry, I, I'm hearing uh, currently that, you know, they're rewriting all the mental health laws here in the UK and everything, or well, they're re- starting to bolster them. Um, and th- the general sort of gist in the mainstream is that if you refuse vaccines or if you go against the uh, WHO or, you know, if you're one of these people that won't wear a mask, then, and it's now been reduced to one person, one so-called qualified person can label you mentally ill and section you. Um, Is there, do you think in fracking history there was... Do you think there was a reason why there were so many mental uh, asylums and some of these things that we've been looking at in the mud flood era and the Tartarian sort of archaeology and that sort of thing? That these things were absolutely enormous, massive, and they were in the massive. middle of Poland, and and you know there was only three million population, and you know there's like ten percent of the population were were condemned into asylums and do you think maybe these people weren't mad they were just sort of rebelling against what sort of tyranny was being pushed upon them at that point but they were just you know thrown into these buildings and and declared mad oh Oh, bollocks (laughs) we lost him uh oh! Did they get him? I was trying to go say hey to Chad for a second because I've been ignoring it completely because I'm so wrapped up in Jerry. Damn it! He Just said like that, that we would have problems. He prophesied that <laughs> we would most likely have electronic interference trying to get this information out. That almost every show he's done, something along these lines have happened. Let me uh, hang on. I have his information. You guys cover, and I'll get with him. Well, we haven't else even there? really touched on the good stuff yet. Anyone else got any thoughts on that about why these? Uh, no, not you know, until this moment, John. When you said it, it was like no shit. Because I was going to ask him when he talked about how big the place was when he got to it. That at that time it was the biggest one. I'm like, yeah, but I saw it in that video. There were bigger ones back in the day, and I was going to get into the mud flood where you went. So, but I didn't want to sidetrack him at all because <laughs> I knew we would have to get to the goodies in a minute. Let me go get him back on. Hang on. Okay, well, hang on to it, I'll be quiet. Nope, we're just going to wait for you, up. Walt. Yep. Hurry up. <laughs> no, it's just fascinating. He, He's scubas. He goes down into the water, you know. He flies. He say, goes up into the air. I mean, this guy covers everything. I was going to say, his CV is, like touches all of us, you know, like. I'm a scuba diver. You're a welder. I'm into welding and he's, gardening, um, pilot gardening, exactly. Camping, it's nature, nature. He <laughs> <laughs> sort of covers the gambit, doesn't it? So, yeah, yeah, and do-it-yourself projects, stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's my type of guy. It's yeah, you know, I, sit around I almost, a campfire with. Almost don't want to talk about the psychiatric stuff. I want to, you know, just ask his opinion on welding. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see if he's done any plumbing. It's, uh, you know. <laughs> Gravity fed hot water systems. Yeah. So Jerry, can you pick a lock? Yeah, yeah. that would that would set it right there. Wasn't he Could saying you be my uncle? Some split personalities suddenly were lock picking aficionados and that sort of thing. Did someone mention that the other day? Wow. You. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I was talking about that book I had read that I didn't realize Split was based on the minds of Billy Milligan, where yeah, this guy acquired those skills that were just out there. Hang on, I'm still struggling here. It's like the Matrix, isn't it? I just, I've just no kung fu. Download it, yeah. Yeah, it's like the other day. I, I just learned Moa carburetors. <laughs> And it worked. <laughs> carburetors are amazing. And you know, if you just fiddle with the air filter and the carburetor a little bit, you get like 80 miles to a gallon on a V8 engine. <laughs> just well crazy believe. stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, this kid not. in Indiana, like 19 years old, figured it out. And they paid him like 2 million bucks and he moved off to California. I never Shut got up. to meet him. Yeah, just to, to sell it. They wanted the patent on it. They wanted to... Yeah, they Keep bought it. Keep quiet. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there if Rod's telling you about <laughs> telling you, it happens every friggin' time. That was a complete meltdown. It was a, it, it, it was a complete freeze up of my computer. That's and my wife, my wife is working on another computer with the same router in another room, and this one freezes up. <laughs> I just sent you a text because I figured, well, he's got the email, so I sent you a text and yeah. telling you to use that same link. Glad you're back. Thank you. Okay, so... So, Jerry, yeah, just, pick up where you left off without my um, distracting <laughs> questions. What, what was I talking about before being so rudely interrupted? By um, the, the history, the, the early history uh, of history. Um, okay. psychiatry so and asylums and... Yeah, well, there was a comment about the DSM-3. And now it's a DSM-5. It started off with like 57 diagnoses that they made up. They, they got together and they go, well, these are, these are the symptoms. And, and they're kind of like a loose list of symptoms. And they bleed back and forth. You know, so it's, it's incredible that they can even make them precise enough to where, where you can remember them. But who can remember 297 of them and more added every year? And every single one is completely made up. There's not a lab test. There's no <laughs> physiological test. There's there's no electronic EEG, EK. There's nothing. But they know. also morph, don't they? Like polio morphed into five different um, syndromes or whatever. Oh, yeah. They morph into subcategories, you know, subcategory A, subcategory B. Yeah, and, and that's their Bible. And, and it's, it's all completely fabricated. Every single one of those things. For a while, they had uh, Southern Bell Syndrome in there. They, they had um, mental retardation was a mental illness. I bet they have a pill for every one, though, don't they? Oh, yeah. They got a pill for everything. Matter, mm -hmm. matter of fact, uh, you know, I was having trouble sleeping a while back, and they gave me tramazepine or something like tamazepan, that. Tamazepan. You know, when the, there's, there's two of them that are similar. This was just for sleep. And it was this little itty bitty pill. It was tiny. And I, yeah, I took it and knocked me out for two days. You know? <laughs> That's like the next two days later, I was still like, well, you know, you, you want to be relieved of the burden of consciousness. Take one of those things, man. <laughs> tramadol was another one. That yeah, yeah, tramadol. Good uh, grief. That you know, so is... it, 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 all those All those psych drugs. So what they... What they want you to think is that there's a, a physical cause for, you know, they're going back to Hippocrates, there's a physical cause for everything, but they can't prove a physical cause for any of this stuff. You know, so they give you these, these drugs and the antipsychotics don't cure anything. What they do is they're major tranquilizers, so they calm you down you know, and they reduce the symptoms, but they don't get rid of them. So in the U.S., it costs roughly about seven hundred and fifty dollars for any psychotic drugs for a month to stay sane, and then you have to pay maybe one hundred and fifty to go to a psychiatrist to to get a prescription. So the, the psychiatric mafia has got this all locked up with the drug companies. You cross the border sixty miles south of here and go to Mexico, you can see a psychiatrist for you know fifty bucks and, and walk into a drugstore and get these antipsychotic drugs without a prescription. You know, it, so the whole thing costs you maybe 75 bucks. And then after that, you know, 50 bucks for the prescription, you don't have to go back again. You know what you need. You go get those things if you can tolerate them. What's sad is once you have this in your system, 
you don't just run out. You don't just, oops, I forgot to fill my prescription this month because you'll lose your fucking, you'll lose your mind because you'll go through some psychotic stuff. Yeah, you it, don't it, ever it, just go cold turkey. You have to titrate off these things. Well, yeah, and it takes a couple of weeks. I mean, once you've been on it for a while for, for that to, to kind of come back. But and the, and the, here the in the UK, I don't I don't know anyone. Well, there are very few people I know who are not on some sort of drugs, um, whether it's to calm their nerves or whether it's for diabetes or anything else. I mean, even the children around here, you know, they they've yep. been on drugs since they were um, single digits. And yeah, they tried this 35 years ago on me. They said I was a hyperactive child. Oh, yeah. yeah. That yeah. didn't take my, – my teacher told my mom he doesn't take his school career seriously. <laughs> my mom told him, I don't want to know a six-year-old that takes his school career seriously. That's my mom's – yeah, she was like, no, yeah, you're good not for her. him on any good, drugs. Good for Your her. mom rocks. <laughs> well, here, here in the U.S., the, the number of children and adolescents – on psychiatric drugs is 7,213,599 and growing. Wow. Um, wow. The number of kids on any psychotic medications is estimated to be 1,194,805. These are kids. They're putting on these powerful antipsychotic drugs. How many psychotic episodes do you think they're creating by putting these children on antipsychotics? Well, it's, I don't know if you've ever tried those things, but boy, you know, they have horrible, horrible side effects. And it's like pouring syrup on your brain. Well, yeah, and this stuff is something that you you don't want to not take. And a child at that age, you know, they it's don't a, understand how serious that kind of stuff is. And But also the problem, even... Uh, uh, um, not the children, but the adults, is that when, or all the children, is that once you're enrolled into this system of drug, of these pharmaceutical drugs um, taken, you're actively told by your doctor, don't take anything else, don't take supplements, don't take this, that, or the other, anything natural. It may affect the drugs that you're on. You must seek. Uh, medical uh, intervention or uh, to work out you, that basically once you're on them there's no coming off them well that's a psychiatric mafia for you you know mm. the, the drug the drug companies are are they have very deep pockets so they were they were the ones that came up in uh, in the united states back in the 1930s they came up with something called the flexner report so basically, mm-hmm. you know, they, these multimillionaires at the time, the guy from Standard Oil and, and these big, big guys with lots of money, basically were saying, OK, medical schools, if you want to graduate people with licenses, you must teach pharmaceutically based medicine and nothing else. So here's the drug companies already pushing in there. So they could not not teach pharmaceutically centered medications, you know, courses. And that's still today. I talked to a psychiatrist this morning, a, a psychiatric student. I asked him, are they, are they still pushing the chemical imbalance theory in there? And he said, yeah, they sure are. So yeah. they're still teaching this theory that has been totally disproved. And bearing in mind that when that Flexner report came out, most, um, most medication in the U.S. came from homeopathy. Tesla's Violet Ray, they had all kinds of homeopathic medicines, they had uh, electrical medicines, they had uh, all, all kinds of different stuff. But once that came out, the, the medical schools couldn't graduate anybody with a license unless they taught pharmaceutical medication, and everybody that didn't was a quack. Were you ever taught about Raymond Royal Rife? No. He had a, uh, using the Tesla tube, the same thing, he went and found all the frequencies to hit certain types of illnesses and diseases and things like that. They actually held a banquet in his honor back in the 30s. I think it was 1932. They called it the Dinner to End All Diseases. And this was by the head of the American 
Medical Association at that time. But he, he, he had a thing. unique... Sorry. Well, yeah, he could actually, he also made microscopes there you go. that could zoom in like 20,000 times. And there was all lenses and he used gases in there to change the diffraction rating so you could see even more. But the difference being is that he could, he could um, view live um, blood cells and, uh, you know, whereas as medication was, uh, the, or modern medicine was stuck to dead cells and everything. He was able to, he developed the microscope that was able to see these things live so that he could hit them with frequencies and, and literally see what was happening to them rather than, and apparently there is no way of recreating his, his, his technology. Design. It's It's gone the way of Don Pettit's uh, <laughs> Tesla, all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. they, they outlawed the Tesla's violet ray at that time. They made it illegal. The, the AMA made it illegal to own one. Now, you can get them today. I have two of them. But it was is, illegal. Is that a dark cell microscope or something? I, I was listening to no, something last it's, night. It's plasma electricity. With high, oh. high voltage with very low amperage. Uh, have you heard of a dark cell microscope? No. Yeah, it's kind of like the Rife machine. Well, the Rife machine, he put it into paddles. So you can put the paddles in certain areas. Or you could hold them in your hands and connect them to your feet. And it was working on the same principles as Tesla, but he had to circumvent uh, probably what you're talking about, that they made that illegal, the tube. Because I remember he started it with using a tube. And then for some reason, and that was the more effective way. And for some reason, he switched over to paddles and pads, things like that, that you could actually put on certain parts of your body. But that makes sense that they made that illegal. Oh. The way they made it sound, it worked better than what they had to go to. Yeah, but they couldn't, make any, they couldn't make any profit on it. No. So, you know, the, the flexion, here's a little blurb on the flexion report. It said, in 1910, the Carnegie Foundation and the Rockefeller Group sponsored the infamous flexion report, which shut down any medical school teaching subjects outside of mainstream pharmacology. The edict was so powerful that only a few medical schools survived, such as John Hopkins and McGill, and a handful of others connected with these groups. They were the only schools who could legally license doctors. Doctors who practice any other method besides pharmacology where the drug companies could make their, their enormous profits were threatened with the loss of their license. Doctors caught using Tesla's violet ray electrical treatment were labeled as quacks and threatened with the loss of their medical license. So, so here's the, the medical mafia right there taking over the practice of medicine and, and forcing doctors to operate with drugs. And, and ruling out everything else, you know, any other treatment that promised any positive result. Was yeah, no cure. Crack, we don't want crack. to cure it. No. We'll give they, you this to fight the side effect yes, they, for the rest they of your life. They don't want to cure. They want endless doses of their medications. And, and that's what's happening with antipsychotics right now. They cure nothing. They, they, they lessen the symptoms. And they have horrible side effects, and they do physiological damage to the peripheral nervous system. They rot out the patient's peripheral nervous system with long-term use. And I've seen them in the state hospital. They call it the Thorazine Shuffle, where these guys, would, they, they couldn't even walk normally. They just kind of shuffled around. Their, their, their nervous mm -hmm. systems were damaged so bad. And the side effects were horrendous. I mean, they couldn't keep them on those medicines because they would eventually go off. And it looked like they were going... You know, they wanted to go crazy um, because they, they wouldn't stay on those meds, which is one of the things I wondered about when I was at the state hospital. It's like, you know, if this is the only thing available to keep you sane, why do you keep going off it? You know, and I must have asked. You know, so, geez. Jerry, when, when did this start dawning on you that what you'd chosen as a career was something quite a bit different as soon as I hit the state hospital <laughs> it was really obvious 
but you had to obviously keep quiet. I mean, did you did you confide in colleagues and things like that? And oh uh, no, no, I couldn't. So, and that was one of the things that was really bad. Um, you know, it it started out with you know you get thrown into the sea of insanity, and here's these. You know, they didn't have any cell phones back then. They didn't have any, you know, what you had is a dial-up telephone. So that's how you communicated. So the what way year are we talking here? We're talking 1970s. Right, gotcha. Probably mid-1970s. So where information got transmitted was in the state hospital central kitchen where all staff went to eat. Uh, central State Hospital was in central Georgia. And back then, it was like a, a little island of, of humanity. They didn't even have a McDonald's or a department store or anything there at the time I was there. There was one mom and pop uh, restaurant. Uh, you had to drive 30 miles to Macon to get a hamburger. Uh, so it was pretty isolated there. Um, they sweetened the pot some by giving you staff dorms uh, that $15 a month with maid service. So it was like a hotel room. It was good to pay off the loans. Um, but, you know, I, I started looking around and here's psychotics doing crazy things, real crazy, dangerous, sickening, you know, just awful things. And I'm like, what, why? And, and it, it just went right in the face of you know, um, what you call experimental psychology where, where they taught that you know, all life forms will seek pleasure and avoid pain. But that's not what these patients were doing. And they were, they were, looked like they were seeking to the pain. They were seeking to self sabotage themselves. Hmm. Um, anytime they came close to succeeding at anything, they, they do something to screw it up. And then you had the more regressed ones. I remember one uh, who cut off his penis, who he was in my friend's unit too. And they sewed it back on, and the talk of the lunchroom for, for a couple of weeks was whether it was going to take or not. So uh, one day I, I, you know, I talked to Ed and I said, uh, hey, Ed, you know, why don't you go ask this guy why he cut his penis off and, and tell me what he says. So, you know, Ed went and hunted him up and asked him. Then we met, uh, met for dinner that night. I said, well, what do you say? What do you say? He said, he said it, he didn't need it anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so there was thing after thing after thing like that where they would do these dangerous, nasty. And suicide was a big. One. I mean, the, the uh, hospital graveyard contained thirty three thousand graves. Wow. And, uh, from, you know, that that hospital had been around since before the Civil War. Matter of fact, Sherman camped his troops there. Um, so it had a long history to it. So there was stuff like that. I'm like, why are they doing this? Why, why are they, why are they doing stuff that feels so horrible and causes permanent damage and it's sabotaging themselves? And it, it just didn't make sense. And uh, so I started asking psychiatrists and, and psych nurses, I said, why, why are they doing this? And, and what are these voices they hear? And you know, maybe. Nine percent of the psychiatrists would say they're well. All of them would say they're hallucinations. Um, but when I asked them what caused that, they would say uh, chemical imbalance. I, I'd, I'd say ninety-five percent of them say it was a chemical imbalance or genetics. Um, With no scientific anything backing up that statement. Nope. Other than what the drug companies and the medical schools were telling me. So, you know, I. What I saw was that even though they're saying it was a chemical imbalance, not once did I see them give any kind of lab test, any kind of electrical test, any kind of any kind of test to see what was out of balance or by how much ever. So how are you going to treat something that's a chemical imbalance and figure out what's unbalanced and by how much if it's a chemical imbalance, if you don't know what the devil you're doing, if you're not given any tests to find out what's going on in there. What I found crazy. out was they had no idea what the chemical balance of the brain should be. There's absolutely no proof of a chemical imbalance. And like I started saying before, this was this was dreamt up by Eli Lilly in the 1970s mm. when Prozac came out, and they knew it was false at the time. But you know, it made sense. Okay, we got this chemical that we're going to put in people's brains, and and you know, most of that is due to. A, a, placebo effect. And if the people believe that the drug does something, then the antipsychotic drug and 
I mean, it does, it, it works better. So they, they have to keep up this perception that it works. It's got to be one of the most powerful things out there is the placebo effect and psychosomatic, psychosomatics and that sort of thing. Do you, do, have, have you been contacted by, um, not necessarily personal colleagues, but other psychiatrists, psychoanalysts uh, recently that have sort of confided in you or do you see any sort of sea change going on that that people are waking up to this or at least your professions are waking up to this? Well, I, I'm in touch with uh, one psychiatrist um, who's, who's, who's kind of, more a natural path. He just recently gave up his license because he didn't like being confined that way. I'm in touch with a, uh, nice. I think a second year psychiatric medical student who, you know, he's going to be the first of the upcoming psychiatrists who, who really know what's going on and I'm carrying on constant conversation with him. Uh, I was just recently contacted by a licensed psychotherapist uh, in New York City who also heard voices. Oh, wow. so, and and he didn't just hear them. He's he's like, what are they? And ex, you know, kind of did experiments with himself <laughs> to, to try to come to some conclusion. And you know, as what happens is is these things aren't hallucinations. They go after buried garbage. Okay, so if you have trauma, if you have your negative thinking. Um, you know, they can smell negative emotional energy like sharks smell blood. Uh, yes, they, will, they, uh, they will attack those people the worst, the hardest. We're coming up on the top of the hour here, but for those, um, I don't know how long this will last on YouTube. Uh, we're going out over several different platforms, I know, but let's get to the crux of it. What What is it that you think is going on here when the you know you're told the voices are just hallucinations you've got a different opinion on that that's been well, tried it, and tested yeah yes and it has been tried and tested and, and sherry who uh, is the co-author of our, our book um, you know, here's here's the skinny of it for anything that we don't catch today the basics are in here and you can get this on amazon Okay, what's the what's the title of the book? Um, it's called An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. Now, Sherry, for decades, ever since she was a kid, she she heard voices, uh, and they were they were trying to destroy her. And she was a, an engineer. She she was hearing voices while she went through college. She got through engineering school hearing voices. And then taking a scientific approach, she found a way to deprogram them. So, so what they do is they run patterns, and she found a way to disrupt those patterns. The first thing that needs to be knocked out is this bullcrap with uh, psychiatry insisting this is a chemical imbalance uh, in the patient's brain. That, that's raw bullcrap. It's been disproven a number of times um, in a number of, of places. So uh, Peter Brigham, who wrote the book Toxic Psychology, verified in 1991 that Eli Lilly started and fabricated the chemical imbalance theory as a marketing gimmick to sell their new drug Prozac. They did this despite the fact that there was no demonstrable evidence that showed depressed people had any chemical imbalance in their brains. And knowing there was no proof, Lilly ran with it to bolster the sale of their drugs. To this day, Big Pharma and Big Pharma-funded medical schools continue along that line. If they don't actually teach the chemical imbalance theory as the cause, they will infer it and say it is believed. But it's been proved wrong over and over again by, by tons of studies. And once, once all these other studies came out, valid studies saying this, this is not the case, um, the Journal of PLOS Medicine on behalf of Mind Freedom got U.S. Senator Ron Wyden to contact the FDA demanding to know why they approved such chemical imbalance propaganda as Lilly and other big pharmaceutical companies got away with by proclaiming that mental illness is caused by a chemical imbalance in the patient's brain. It took the FDA over a year to respond to the journal, and when it finally did, the FDA could not cite a single study or any scientific literature. 
which in any way supported the pharmaceutical industry's claim of the chemical imbalance as a cause of mental illness. Dr. Remo Labo, psychiatrist, echoed findings of Dr. Brigham in stating that the whole myth of the chemical imbalance was created to sell drugs. So it goes on and on and on. But the chemical imbalance theory that the drugs, drug companies and the, the academic mafia are teaching medical students and psychiatric students is completely false, but they're teaching it anyway because it sells drugs. So hmm. the drug companies go to the, the universities and goes, well, we want this result. And any, any research they can do to kind of make it look like there's a correlation, they'll throw that out there and, and say, yeah, there, there is a chemical imbalance in our drugs temporarily fix it or, or address it. So, so are, you seeing, are you seeing a correlation with this at the moment with this COVID nonsense and the germ theory and uh, contagion theory, uh, the, all these theories that w we have – scientific evidence backing up that this theory is incorrect we can't necessarily put our finger on what is correct whether it's terrain theory or i mean <laughs> it just seems it's a well, theory based you, on theory on a theory on a theory i'll tell you what i am seeing the mainstream media reminds me almost exactly of a group of voices, psychotic voices, attacking a patient. The, the theme is the same. It's to foster fear, to foster guilt, to foster right. control. It, 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 you know, it, you could, if they weren't incarnate and coming over the, the TV screen, it would be just like a psychotic attack. Mm. With the voices say, oh, you're going to die, you know, be afraid, you need to watch yourself, you know, get, you know, all this paranoia stuff, you know, stay away from people. And that's one thing these voices do. They break people up. They don't want them to be close. They break up families. They, they break up marriages. They, they tell uh, husbands that their wives are cheating on them and vice versa and that they can't trust anybody and, and you know. And that's know. been media from the very beginning, that's basically. It's the, just fear-mongering, suspicion-breeding, yes. every, everything about them. Is, I mean, it's like that film, isn't it? They Lie. I don't know if you've seen that, where he puts the glasses on and he can see a bay and, and this, that, and the other. It's, just, it's all... And, and to someone who's been trained in, in the psychology side of things, that that sort of pressure to put a human under that sort of pressure is going to cause what i mean you constant fear constant suspicion what what does that what's that going to do to the human psyche or in general well what i discovered maybe years later and this was after i left the, uh, the, the state hospital where i learned the most about these things was in working in the psychology department of the state prison so the problem I ran into in the state hospital was that they didn't want you to do, I mean, psychiatry, I mentioned earlier that psychiatrists were being attacked at a rate much higher than any other staff other than attendants. That's higher than psych nurses, higher than psychologists, higher than, than regular nurses, higher than anybody except attendant staff that were with psychotic patients 24 hours a day. And even then it was only slightly less so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, here's a story every other day or so in the in the lunchroom where a psychiatrist got attacked by a, a schizophrenic psychotic patient. And I'm thinking, like, what in the blazes are they doing to these people to make them attack them when they only see them like 15, 20 minutes a month? Uh oh, I got a message here. Can you guys still hear me? Yep, you still yeah, coming you in. Crackled up for a bit there, but yep. Yep, you're good. And so here, here's all these attacks being launched against psychiatrists, and I didn't understand it. You know, it was, it was, why is this happening? You know, what are they doing to piss these people off in 20 minutes, where they're getting attacked <laughs> at this rate? And, and I didn't understand it. Uh, and then later, I found out that the suicide rate of schizophrenics, which is three times or more higher than the general population is equivalent to that of psychiatrists. Their suicide rate is three times higher than the general population also, mm, which, which is very interesting. 
that's like dentists as well. I think dentists in the UK have got the highest rate of suicide. These well, guys. I, can, I can understand that. Mm. But, but for somebody, you know, they got to work in people's mouths all day. But for somebody that's just pushing pills, I mean, what's the deal? All right. So, so it's centered around the pills. And I didn't know that at the time. And toward the seven years I, I spent at the state hospital there, um, I was finding that they always went off their medicines. And then they would regress back into a psychotic state. And, it, you know, it, 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 it didn't make any sense. It's like if the medicines are the only things that are keep them sane. Now, what we were running, there was a vocational training school also. So we got the highest functioning of the, the hospital patients there, trained them in a vocation. And hopefully they would stay on their meds and they would go out and function in society. So it wasn't just like keep them under control. We wanted these guys to function. And what I saw is as they started approaching success, the ones who were hearing voices, they would always do something to sabotage themselves. They'd either get in trouble or get thrown out of class or attack somebody or do something. But they were constantly sabotaging themselves. And I'm like, why are they doing this? You know, why are they, every time they approach success, they do something to screw themselves up time after time after time. You know, and I'd ask them, I'd say, what's the deal? Why are you going off your meds? And everyone that went off their meds for years, I would ask them, why did you do that? Why'd you go off your meds? You've been off your meds before. You know what happens. Why'd you do it again? Well, I didn't like the side effects. Well, you saw what happened. Well, that's, you know, the side effects, the side effects. So what I did is I did a little experiment. I, I had them write down on a piece of paper all the side effects they had from their particular medicine, you know, which I usually, you know, five or six, and not all of them had the same side effects. And then I went and I went to the DSM at the time, the three, I think it was, or two, and I wrote down all the symptoms for paranoid schizophrenia, you know, mm -hmm. two pages worth. And I said, okay, write down all the side effects you had with, uh, with these drugs. And here, now take this and, and check every symptom you've had, all these horrible symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia when you went off your drugs. And when they did that, they gave them both back and they said, which is worse? No doubt, you know, the, the, the psychosis was much worse, much worse than the side effects, although they were bad. And, and I'd say, well, okay, if... If the psychosis is, is, you know, living hell and it's that bad and it looks like it's even worse than the side effects, why do you keep going off your meds? Mm. You know what they had? They said, what? I don't know. That went on for three or four years asking them the same question. I felt like a, a crazy guy myself asking the same question and expecting a different answer. But scores and scores of them said, okay, it's a side effects. And then when, when I gave them that, that choice, they would say, I don't know. I don't know why I did it. And that's almost like a catchphrase, uh, certainly over here, is that he went off his meds. Mm -hmm. That's why he did it. You know, so-and-so knifed someone in the pub or whatever. And uh, why? And it was like, he went off his meds. And that seems to be the mantra. And right, you're saying that they had no idea why... Why they well, stopped no, their meds? No, they had an idea. It, for them, it was the side effects, which were horrible. Right. But that, you know, when that was negated and you gave them the choice, well, what's worse, the, the going psychotic or the side effects, they would all 100% would choose, well, the psychosis is worse. Then ask the question, well, then, okay, psychosis is worse. And you know what happens when you go off your meds because you don't like the side effects. And, and that result is much worse than the side effects. Then why are you going off your meds all the time? Why do you keep going off your meds? And it wasn't just one. It's scores of them. And I don't is, know was the answer. And I don't know. And I'm like, well, if you don't know who does, you've got to have an answer somewhere. It's got to be yeah. some one of you guys need to know why you're doing this. And then probably toward the end of my seven years there, one girl who was about to get thrown out of the program because she – yeah, and she was doing well in classes, but she went off her meds a third time. And the, the administration's going, well, if they go off their meds three times, the chances are they're not going to stay on them when they're released. So, you know, we're going to cut them out of the program and let them go back home or wherever they go because they're, they're proving us they're not serious about staying on the meds. And at that time, meds were the only thing they had. You know, that, that was all to control this thing. 
So uh, when the mother found out we were about to discharge her, she calls me and, and she's in a frantic. She goes, I can't, I can't handle her here. I can't, I can't deal with her. You guys got to help her. Now I'm going to drive, drive up there. And she was in South Georgia. And so it took her several hours to, and she said, I want to come up and meet with you and my daughter. And, you know, I want to talk her into staying on her meds and give her another chance. So the mother was desperate. So I met with her one Friday afternoon and, um, uh, both of us, her mother and I, are sitting in there with, with the patients, and both of us are asking, "Why did you do this? You've done it before. You've done you, you've done it a number of times before, and you get the same result every time. You go crazy and you get in trouble. Why? Why did you do it?" And and she goes, "You won't believe me." If I told her, "You won't believe me," and I said, "Well, you know, I've heard some pretty pretty incredible things here. I, I don't <laughs> think you can say anything that's going to shock me. You know, <laughs> what, what what is it? What what what? Why did you go off your and She said, "The voices." told me that they were poisoning, that the psychiatrist was poisoning. Mm -hmm. And they pointed to the side effects as the, you know, they said, well, look at the side effects. You're being poisoned. Look at all these bad things that are happening to you. The, the medicines are poisoning. you. And, and actually, they were. It was a slow form of poison. And they were pointing that out and directing her attention toward that constantly. And after I heard that, it went, click. That's why all the psychiatrists are getting beat up. The voices are telling them. That yeah, defend yourself. Yeah, they're poisoning the, the patients, and the patients are being forced to take the meds, so they're attacking. The yeah, that's not a that's not an aggressive thing. That's fight or flight that they're yeah. going through at that moment. Yeah, and they're paranoid, and the psychiatrist is poisoning them. So, yeah, like the psychiatrist, and that was even happening, you know, in private hospitals. Even even when I was working in private psych hospitals. So it was like um, back in the in the state hospital, you know, I saw they weren't giving any lab tests, so that the chemical imbalance thing was was out as far as I was concerned. It didn't hold any water. So if it wasn't a chemical imbalance that was causing their psychosis, what what was going on? So, so was I, I started, it always voices? Was it always voices? The, these people no, they, were. What I was working with mostly were the paranoid schizophrenics who heard voices, but they also saw things. Okay. You know, they, they saw all kinds of horrible hallucinations also. And, and then were they were so similar to others? Were like the, the things they were seeing was another person also seeing similar things? Well, there was more variation in the visual hallucinations than there were in the auditory hallucinations. But what I saw is patterns beginning to come into play in the auditory hallucinations. Okay, so the voices, which are the number one symptom of paranoid schizophrenia, they hear these horrible voices telling them to do horrible things to others and to themselves. And you know, as I began asking them about the voices, patterns started appearing. And one of the first patterns that I saw was that when the chaplain at the state hospital gave a ice cream social with cake and ice cream and all this good stuff that they couldn't get their hands on often, you know, all the schizophrenics would stay in their beds in the dingy ward. You know, and I'd walk down the ward and I'd go, why aren't you down with the other guys? I mean, it's free ice cream and cake, the chaplain. Well, I don't like chaplains. I don't believe in God. I, you know, I don't know. And you look on their bed stands and here's all these horrible books, you know, murder mysteries and, and, and crime things and, and war stories. And it's all negative reading material. I noticed that, but I, did, I didn't know what to make of it. But they didn't want to be around the chaplain. So I'm like, well, that's interesting. And why don't you want to be around chat? And it's like, well, the voices don't like him. And, and they don't like me reading the Bible. And, and so I started, when I hear something like that, I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of put it in the back of my head like I did those other things. And then when another patient comes up, I'll ask them about it. So when, you know, after I ask a dozen patients or so, and that they're all saying the same thing, there's, there's a pattern emerging there. And, and one of the things that emerged is that the voices did not like the patient reading the Bible or any positive spiritual material. They didn't like them going to church. They didn't like them having fun. So, and that was consistent. And, and so I started asking them about this. I said, what happens when you read the Bible? Well, the voices get louder. They say it's a crock of crap, that it's all made up, that Jesus couldn't even save himself. What makes you think he's going to save you? And they would get louder and distract them from reading the Bible. And this was consistent among all, almost all of them. 
So here's this pattern forming, and I'm thinking, you know, what kind of hallucination would, would be anti-religious? I mean, why would you even expect that to happen? If they're a hallucination, they should be random like all other hallucinations. Why is there a pattern forming here? Why are, why are they anti-religious? Why should they even be anti-religious? And so I pushed that further, and I found there were three groups. Um, one were patients who felt they knew what the voices were. And they knew that it wasn't who they were. There was an, a middle group that weren't sure what the voices were. They, they were thinking maybe they were them, maybe they weren't, they weren't sure. And then there was a third group that believed what psychiatry was telling them, that the voices were hallucinations. They, and they were much worse off. And, and virtually none of these guys wanted to go to church. So... Um, you know, I kept asking questions about the voices, and then one day, uh, I guess the voices got pissed off from one guy, and he went and told psychiatry that I was irritating him by asking him questions about his voices. Now, these guys are getting beat up by psych psychotics all the time, and, and they were kind of leery about doing anything to upset them. So the unwritten rule was you don't do anything to upset a psychotic patient if you don't absolutely have to. And asking questions about their voices was something that you didn't absolutely have to do. So I got yeah, pulled you up. Don't do yeah. <laughs> you don't do it. Yeah, that's what you were taught. <laughs> you don't do it. So I got pulled up in in, in the front of the psychiatrist, and you know, here he is lecturing me that the voices are, are are hallucinations. And and when you ask them questions about them, you're reinforcing their reality, and you're making these patients worse, and you're making them more upset. And this one came in and complained to me about this. You need to stop doing that. And that happened twice while I was at the state hospital. They didn't want anybody asking these guys questions about their voices. So I had to go underground because I, you know, that had already been threatened once. And then I had to be real careful of how much I asked. So I, I might only ask one pertinent question per patient a day or something. So I had to really slow it down. But the patterns were still emerging. And, and I was having to fly under the psychiatrist's radar. And, and the more that's what I was going to ask, did you feel like you had to keep yourself oh, yeah. safe within your friend? I mean, your uh, your peers, not necessarily your oh, yeah. friends. Yeah, I, I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk to any of them about about this stuff. Uh, you know, which was a, a bad thing. It was like it was almost like. Um, you know, I was opening the door to this strange new world, and there were consistent patterns there, but I had no roadmap. You know, I had no cognitive map of, of what was going on there. So, I'd, you know, I'd kind of walk in there and I'd start tripping over things, and, and bad things would start happening, and uh, the voices would, would start screaming at them. And, um, by the time I left the state hospital, I strongly suspected that the voices were not hallucinations. Um, and, and schizophrenics were so frustrating to work with. You know, I was glad to get back to graduate school and just be away from them for a while. It's like, well, yeah, because they're thinking you're trying to get them in trouble or trying to, you know. And then they have the voices telling them not to talk about them. Well, that, that was true, but I didn't know that at the time. I found yeah. that out in the prison. The voices would say, and this happened over and over, voices would come up and go, he, he already knows too much. Don't tell him anymore. Shut up. You know, so, and, the, and the guy would tell me that. And it, and it would happen time after time after time. Jerry, so like, real quick, when you say voices, just so I can get this straight in my head, are we talking about like an auditory hallucination with stereo spatial reference for your ears? Or are we talking like strange thoughts popping in your head that don't feel like your own? When you say yeah. voices, what does that sort of entail? Yeah. Interesting question. The, the one time I prayed to hear them, okay, and they, and they almost killed me, and that's a long story in and of itself. Yeah. But the voice, the voice I got, sounded just like any of the thousands of thoughts that go through my head any day. And, but the intent was far different than anything that I could even imagine or would even react to. And, um, but it sounded just like my normal thoughts. Huh. So it, it's that's scary. The, the, I think you know, all of you guys probably experiment experience it. We're all hit by these things to different degrees. 
So you, mm-hmm. you're walking down the sidewalk, and all of a sudden, this horrible thought barges into your head to do something completely absurd and push horrible. that guy into traffic, throw that guy off the cliff, yeah, shove yeah. that dude in the street, yeah, yeah, right. run him off the road, you know. And it's something you would never do. And you know, the, the one that I, I did. one of the ones I remember most was you know I have a, a beautiful you know, Alaskan you know, part wolf white, totally white sled dog. I mean, what do they call them? Nice. So, um, so, so here's this voice comes up one day while I'm cutting cactus out in the backyard and, and the dog runs by and here's, here comes his thought, cut her head off. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's nothing I would ever do or, or even think about on my own. And I'm like, well, where did that come from? Well, I know exactly. Where that Almost like they're fishing. Almost yes. like they're seeing who will listen to them almost. Yeah, and, and they'll do that. And there's lots of people who, you know, they're driving down the road and they go, well, run the car off the road. You know, run into oncoming traffic. Jump off this bridge. Now, when, so, when people say they, um, now I saw in chat earlier, <laughs> yeah, I do look occasionally, um, the voices, can we say the voices equal archons is what I saw. But do any of the people that you spoke to assign names to yes. the voices? Yeah, they do. Some of them do. And you know, are they familiar names or, uh, you know, um, Satan? Or? Well, yeah, I don't think any of them call them Satan. But they, they would give them names like uh, the Screamer or the Professor or... Uh, Kate or um, you know, some some patients feel they are demons because that's one of the patterns. So if if you look at these things and you start asking patients about them, which psychiatry never does. Matter of fact, psychiatry will tell them these are auditory hallucinations. They're not real. They're due to a chemical brain imbalance. So even if the, the patient's trying to tell them about what they're experiencing, they don't listen. They shut them off completely. It's like, you know, I don't want to hear it. Don't want to see it. Take these meds and shut up. That's frustrating as a patient. Yeah. That would piss me off so bad. Well, what what happened? They get pissed off, then they drug you suddenly. You know, they drug you senseless. Oh, you're getting pissed off, so you're unstable. You know, we're going to inject you with this crap. So they don't listen. And so they have no research whatsoever on the voices or the patterns they run. The hallucinations are random. They, they regular hallucinations. They're positive. They're negative. They're all over the place. They're they're all over the spectrum. The voices, the, the schizophrenics here, for the most part, are negative. You know, they're they're saying bad things about the patient. They're they're yelling at them. They're making them feel guilty. They're saying bad things about um, all their friends, their wives. They're, it's consistently unswervingly negative. So what holds them on that trajectory? Why are they within that narrow band instead of all over the place like the reg- regular, um, like regular hallucinations? So th- they run a number of, of, you know, other patterns, a lot of other patterns. They, they're anti-religious, general. You know, hallucination is you know, why would you expect a, a hallucination to be anti-religious? They attack most often after dark, and the hardest between three and four in the morning. Why would that happen? You, you talk Uh-oh. to schizophrenics; they say, "Yeah, they, they come on after dark. They come on when it's dark, and, and they wake me up at, at three in the morning, and they start screaming." Um, they instill nightmares. You know, they, there's horrible nightmares, and when the guy wakes up, the voices start right in. Um, they don't like they don't like uh, pleasant music. They want acid rock. You know, they want this this horrible yeah you know, kill murder beat them up. Uh, they love that stuff. So, so again, what weird, what, what conclusion did you come to as to what we're dealing with here? Is it man made? Is it uh, no, no, it's interdimensional? Not. Is it it's demons? Right. Well, I guess you could you can you could call them demons. So, you know, when you when you have this this whole list of patterns, 
you know it's not a hallucination. Hallucinations don't run time. So psychiatry is wrong with their chemical imbalance thing. They're wrong and they have no, no evidence or research to prove that these things are hallucinations because they haven't ever looked into it. They haven't done any research. They've been told they were hallucinations. They don't make sense to them. So they're hallucinations. So that's what they're taught and they're still teaching it today. Yeah, and they're, they're following to, the manual, aren't they? Following the manual. I talked to you know my friend who's a psychi- psychiatric student this morning. He said, yeah, they're still teaching that. They're, they're still giving us that same stuff. But it's based on nothing. They have nothing. No research, nothing. They won't even listen to these guys, so there's no chance they're going to they're, they're gonna find this out. And and it's it's worthless trying to talk to them. Uh, Professor Ermark, who, who saw a shaman in Turkey cure a number of schizophrenics, Went to a journal and he wrote in a, a, an accredited journal. He said, "Hey, you know, the medical medical people ought to at least take a look at this." They attacked him all upside, one side down the other. They 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 attacked him. They attacked the journal, and he was being attacked by doctors. He was being attacked by psychiatrists. They even attacked the journal. How could you dare suggest such a such a crazy thing? You're, you're trying to drag the profession back to the Stone Age, and they were yeah, just yeah. How can this be published? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How could you even publish something like this? You know, and that's where the truth is. But you know, they 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 they're so brainwashed. And here was this lady from Oxford, this this hotsy totsy professor from Oxford, that had no psychiatric training at all, and she's attacking him worst at all of all. I wrote her back and, and blasted her. It's like, you don't know your butt from a hole in the ground. You never talk to a schizophrenic. You don't know what they are. You don't know what they're experiencing. Who are you to say anything? I mean, I just freaking blasted her and uh, waited for her to hear back from her. I never did. What was your, I guess, aha moment when you finally said, okay, this is definitely not anything from the books, from my professors, from my colleagues? When did you finally go, hmm? You There's know what? Outside I, force here. What was the aha case moment? I denied this for years after I got out of the state hospital. You know, I suspected it, but I didn't want to believe it. So, what I found is that when you start disrupting these patterns, that the voices run and interfere with those patterns, so they can't get their negative message through. These guys start getting better. So I was experimenting with different things that would interfere with their patterns. It started off with a rubber band that just snapped that would shut them up temporarily. And if, if the, what, what several of them told me that is that when they repeated the 23rd Psalm, the voices reacted as if they were worms thrown onto a hot frying pan. Wow. So, so I'm thinking, okay, anything that agitates these things and that they don't like, give them more of it. Yeah. Now I, now, I couldn't do that in the state hospital because I'd be in trouble right away. But in the state prison, you know, a, 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 a psychotic inmate going to the warden and complaining to the, the psych was asking him about his voices wouldn't even break the ambient noise level. That. <laughs> He'd just get out of my face. Man. Yeah. Get lost. Go, go play in the traffic or something. You know? so, so I had I had complete freedom. And so what I did... Is, is when they closed down the state hospitals, they threw all these guys out on the street and they had no way to survive except by crime. They'd steal stuff, they couldn't hold a job, and they all ended up in the state hospital or in the state prison. So here was here they were again. You know, I was surrounded by them again. So what I did there is I always had a group of schizophrenic prisoners that I worked closely with, and the agreement was that I'll help you as much as I can. I'll do everything I can for you. You know, I'll intervene with medical and what, the other stuff. I mean, I had limited powers of sight, but um, as long as you told me in real time what the voices are telling you is right in real time as we're talking. So if a voice barges in and says something while we're holding this conversation, you need to tell me what they're saying. And did you all superiors know that you oh, were doing me. that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Matter of fact, it got kind of touchy at times because they'd come in. And I remember one guy going, uh, yeah, this guard disrespected me. I'm going to stab him. You know, and I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what that left was like, okay, how much can I trust this guy? How much control does he have? So it was like walking on the edge of a razor blade because it's, it's – if I missed it, and this guy went and stabbed the guard, and they found out that I knew that he was thinking about that and didn't turn him in, 
Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be fired. That'd be that'd be that'd be it. I'd, I'd be done. On the other hand, if that was not his real intention, and he was just saying that because he trusted me, and and he had no real motivation to do that, and I yeah, you don't want to lose that trust. Yeah. Not only would I lose the trust of him, but lose everybody, the trust of every single one there, and I'd never get it back. Mm-hmm. So, so it was like dancing on the edge of a razor blade, and, and I made it clear to him. I said, you know, listen. As long as I'm convinced you're not going to hurt yourself or anybody else, I'm not going to take action against you. I'm not going to do anything to interfere with your life here. But well, the danger, I, yeah, if danger I have, was if I real. Think otherwise, yeah, if I think otherwise, I'm, I'm going to have to act. Because they, so, they could have knifed you. Yeah, yeah, and, and one, one of them was dead. But you asked about where, where I finally turned. So I was in denial for years when I hit the prison. And, and as we found ways to interfere with the voices, these guys started getting better. So all of them at about the same time come in and go, the voices are really getting pissed at you. They really don't like what you're doing. They're telling me not to come here. Um, they're telling me to beat you up. Uh, they, they don't, they're really getting pissed at you. And, and here I am thinking uh, the hallucinations getting pissed at me. And what, why is the hallucination getting kissed at me? And they're all saying the same things. And these guys didn't meet each other. I mean, it wasn't like they met in a group. We met one on one. Um, so here's, here comes this flurry of, yeah, the voices are getting pissed at you. And then one of them who I've been working with for a good while, he turns around the doorway one day and he looks me right in the eye and he goes, you know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And then he turns around wow. and walks away. And I'm like, no, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think it's dangerous. It, that these voices are in you, in you guys. They're not in me. They're they're stuck in you. They can't come out. You know. So I'm reassuring myself with that rationalization. Um, I was later to find out that was not the case. <laughs> so um, I think the one that turned me was that same guy who gave me that warning. Um, he comes in and he goes. Uh, and this was without an appointment. He knocks at my door and he, he goes, uh, the voices want to talk to you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Wow. Yeah, they, they want to tell you something. I mean, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, this isn't you. This is the voices, right? And he goes, yeah, this is the voices have a message for you. And he said, well, come on in and sit down. And I sat back and I said, well, what do they have to say? And these words came out of his mouth. I'll never forget him. He said, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And then the, the, the inmate said, that, that wasn't my words, that was them. They said that, that didn't come out of me. You know, that, that, they said that. And, and you know, I was like stunned because I knew that wasn't the, the, the guy. I mean, I, I, uh-huh. I, I could feel it, I knew it. And I sensed it. That's, where, that's where I began. That, that was the first time I went through. Okay, these things are separate entities. They're not some part of the subconscious. Uh, they're not some part of, of the brain or the mind. They, this is a separate entity who's kind of threatening me at this point. Um, have, you, have you ever thought why they don't talk to you directly? Well, they did. It, it, oh, okay. They, they did later <laughs> on. I would carry on conversations with them. Um, not long enough to realize that they were independent entities and they were responding independent of the patient. And, uh, you know, about that time, well, what happened afterwards is the same guy, he came in one day and uh, so that, that's where it cracked. That's, that, that's where my denial system started coming unglued was when you have no right to interfere with our way of life. I mean, I, I knew that was something other than the, the patient talking to me. So he comes in a couple of weeks later, and I didn't stop. You know, I didn't back off. I'm still thinking, well, they're stuck in them. They're, they can't get me. They're, they're stuck in, in, in the guy. So um, what I did is I ran into a book by Miguel Ruiz, who's a shaman, a South American shaman. He was talking about entities that um, were perceived as voices and that they sucked the individual's energy. And that's a pattern I also noticed is that after the prisoners were attacked by these voices, 
their energy levels dropped to zero, to nothing. You know, they just couldn't even get out of bed after being attacked by these things. And I was thinking, uh, well, let's do the anxiety. I mean, they're always telling them horrible things, saying they're going to kill them, they're going to stab them, that somebody's going to come and get them. I mean, they're fostering paranoia constantly. So I was thinking, well, if you're under, you know, if you're paranoid for that length of time, it's probably going to wear you out. And, and I felt that, I believed that for years until one day I, I was put over the jail for the prison. So this is, this is the place where the worst of the worst from the entire prison complex go. And they always seem to be assigned to the worst places, which for me, I, you know, being an adrenaline junkie, I love that. <laughs> but I, I ran into, here these guys are locked into a cell made for one person, but there's two people in there. And they're, they're under maximum security. They only come out one hour a day, and they put them in a cage where they can get one hour of sunlight. So uh, I go into my office one morning, and here's a inmate letter from uh, one of the prisoners in the central detention unit saying my roommate's psychotic, and, and he's staring at me at 3 in the morning in the dark, and he's standing there just looking over me, and he's hearing voices, and he's weirding me out. And, you know, come help me. So right after I, I read that, I got a call from the captain of that unit. He said, hey, we got a real psychotic uh, patient who's not on meds in, in one of the uh, units, and he's driving his, um, his roommate and his cellmate crazy. You need to come over and see what you can do about this. So I go over there, and they were both in the same cell. <clears throat> so it's a perfect experimental situation. I mean, they, they were eating the same food in the same environment with the same guards. and I mean, everything was equalized. You know, except what was going on in their heads. I mean, same, same beds, the same, you know, everything's equalized. So I call them out one at a time. And I call out the guy who, uh, I look up his record, the guy who wasn't psychotic and, and was in the bottom bunk and his crazy roommates looking, staring down at him at night. And I look up his record. And what he'd done is snitched off a big drug deal for the Aryan Brotherhood and the Aryan Brotherhood. And they wanted him dead because they got the leaders, the ringleaders, and they, sh they shipped them to prisons all over the state. They broke up the entire gang. They confiscated all their drugs. And they were furious. They were, they were set to kill. They wanted revenge, and they wanted this guy dead. They wanted him dead so badly that they got in trouble. A couple of them got in trouble just so they could be sent to the central detention unit to have a chance to kill this guy. Wow. And every time they walked by his cell, they would say, you, know, so you should come out of there, we got you, man, you're dead, man. I mean, then they, they'd throw notes under his door saying, you're dead, you're walking dead, man, you're, you're done. And here's this guy trapped in this little tiny room, this, this little cell with this completely psychotic guy. And so not only are the gangsters trying to kill him, he's, he's trapped in this room with this, this lunatic who's not on meds, hearing voices pacing at three in the morning and staring at him. Uh, you couldn't be under too much more stress other than in, in war or something like that. So I pulled him out and, and watched him as he came out of his cell. And he had plenty of energy. He just kind of bounded up the steps and walked briskly to the interview room. And he sat down, and uh, I'm, I'm watching his affect, and he had plenty of energy. I mean, he was nervous, he was anxious, he was fearful, but he had plenty of energy. His, his uh, volume was good, his voice tone was good, his, his speech rate was good. Um, you know, he was just like somebody who was very upset, but he had plenty of energy. So I got all the information there, told him I'd do what I could to help him out, sent him back to his cell and then called out the psychotic guy. He could barely make it up the steps. And he grabbed the handrail and he was just struggling to get up the steps. He shuffled over to the interview room. He sat down with the rag and he was limp. And he, he was just like, in a very slow speech, just, you know, like he was struggling to answer questions. And, and he was hearing voices and um, no energy whatsoever. So after I was done those two interviews, I went, well, no, that's not it. it, it it's, not, it's not due to the anxiety. So what is it? You know, what, what, is, what is causing this energy drain? It was consistent. Every time the voices would attack, these guys would be drained of energy. Some of them even said, hey, I could feel my energy leaving. And they drained them so bad that they couldn't even get out of bed. And they couldn't function. Every time, it was like a one-to-one -one correlation. When the voices appeared, their energy disappeared. So I'm like, what's with that? And um, 
So I, I read this thing from Miguel Ruiz where he's talking about these entities who, who lived off the negative emotional energy of people. And I went, that's exactly what these guys are telling me. So I brought that book into the prison and I brought the guy in whose voices warned me. You know, he said, uh, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And I, I said, uh, hey, I, I got this from the shaman. He's, he's written stuff that sounds like your voices. I want to read this to you and tell me what you think of that. So I, I was reading away and I got to the part where he, uh, the shaman, Miguel Ruiz, started talking about these entities draining the energy of the victims. And man, this loud electrical crackling just exploded in the back of my, at the wall in the back of my head. And it's like, it sounded like an artwork. It's like crack, 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 crack. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, I, I look around, there's nothing there. And the thing starts moving to the wall, office wall to the right, and it starts crackling up the wall. And I look at the, the, the inmate and I said, do you hear that? And he's just staring at me with this weird look like him. And just a weird gaze. And it's like he was a zombie. He didn't say anything. He's just staring at me. And I'm like, he's going to attack. So I, I push my chair against the wall and get ready for him to come. If he comes on, I, I, I kick him. And then it's, you know, they always assign female guards to the medical unit. And, and they'd be worthless at, at anything like this. And by the time any male guard got there, it would all be over one way or the other. And so I was gearing up to you know, have to fight and uh, pushed the, my, my desk against the wall and got ready. And this, this crackling just kept going, crack, 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 all the way up the wall on a 45 degree angle up to the ceiling in the back. And then crack, 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 all, of, all along. And I, like, I didn't want to take my eyes off the, the inmate because I thought he was going to attack, but I was trying to see what this was and I could see nothing. I could smell nothing. You know, I could feel nothing, but, but I could certainly hear it, and it was loud, and it must have lasted for 20 to 30 seconds. So it goes all across the back wall, and it starts coming down the left wall. Crack, 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 crack. All the way down to there, here's this rubber made trash can on my left, and it leaps in there, and I look down in there, and there's nothing there. It's completely empty. They made a quarter and cleaned it the night before. There's nothing in there, and it, it, it's crackling. I look at him, and the crackling stops. It just went dead. And I'm like, what the hell just And he slowly gets up and he goes, I got a need. He shuffles over to the door and I'm like, get the hell out of here. Go, go, <laughs> go. And, and I, was, I was absolutely stunned. You know, just, I, I, I searched the wall so there was no burn, so there was nothing I could see. It never came back. I, I went out into the hall and I, I checked all the office doors for all the doctors down the hall. There was nobody there. They were all locked. It was first thing in the morning. Nobody was there except the guard out front and me. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm absolutely stunned. And, and you know, I couldn't explain it. And it, it was like I was so shocked and dumbfounded that I canceled appointments for the rest of the day and just sat there staring out the window. There was no doubt now. This was the first time that I had seen them actually come out and do something in physical reality outside of the patient. So here I'm thinking, okay, I'm pissing these things off. And if they can come outside and affect physical reality, what else can they do? And, and it, it, for me, it was a shock because it was like playing in a dark room with rattlesnakes and, and just realizing that their room is full of rattlesnakes. And so it's like, where are they and what are they doing and, and how do they operate and how can I stay away from them and how can I stay safe? You know, so, but you can't, you can't see them. And, and there's, there's nobody I could talk to about this. You know, I couldn't go to the chief psychologist and go, hey, I was uh, talking to this guy about his voices and the my room started crackling like a heart brother all over the place. And, and, you know, the inmate was acting strange and, and I'm hearing these things and, you know, you, you can't go tell people about this. There's nobody I could talk to. You, know, so was, was, you, you retired in, what, 2015? Well, I, I, after I got out of, yeah, I don't know, it was like... Uh, Have you been labeled a quack ever since? Or yeah, You know what? There's nobody who's, who's come on because they really don't have ground to stand on. They have no research on the voices. They know that the chemical imbalance theory is a bunch of crap. 
They can't prove that the voices aren't real because they don't have any studies on them. I have a million psychotics here and schizophrenics who will say they are. I have the, the guy that just contacted me who was a, a therapist in New York. Was, you know, he'll say they are. Matter of fact, all these patterns can be checked out. All they got to do is look. I can list these things and say, this is what you watch for. It's not a hallucination because here are the patterns. Look and see for yourself. Just open your eyes and you'll see them. They, can't, well, they don't have a leg to stand on. They really don't. All I can say is um, welcome to the world of the flat earther. Because <laughs> it's exactly the same. We have all the evidence. They have no evidence. And w there's nothing you can say that will get through to them. It's um, Well, that, yeah. that's exactly right. So, so you say, you know, am I making any headway with my profession in, in psychology? No, I'm not going to. They, won't, they, won't, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. The drug, they're, they're the puppets of the drug companies. They're going to do what the drug companies say. And drug companies have very deep pockets, so they paid off Congress to to do their bidding for them. Um, you know, they license these guys. The, the, the medical schools teach what the drug companies want them to teach. So it's a completely controlled system. Well, it's like government. Uh, it, yes, it's it's it, it's broken beyond fixing. And it's not a case of trying to adapt yourself to persuade these people that are closed-minded and just cannot see what you're talking about and been brainwashed, quite literally. It's about recreating um, a new reality uh, in which they don't exist anymore because they're irrelevant. Well, it, it's not so much a new reality because these things hit us all. Like I was saying, you know, you, you get these thoughts from time to time. Matter of fact, every negative thought you get about yourself or somebody else is coming from them. It's not your thought. One of the things we're, we're taught from the time we're kids is that all your thoughts are yours. You know, who else could they be? If they're not yours, where else do they belong? You know, and, and they're not. You know, Emmanuel Swedenborg well, says like none of your thoughts kids. are yours kids are taught those those dark things in the room aren't real that's just dreams and that's just your imagination i mean right. we show up here seeing it we show up here experiencing right. it they we know they're there just like yeah. the animals our pets know they're there but yeah, the conclusion to this uh, this this crackling story when we finish that off is i i didn't have the guts to call this guy in for probably two to three months <laughs> i didn't want to see him <laughs> Finally, I don't finally, blame you. My, my curiosity got the best of me, and I called. It, uh, I had the guards bring him in, and uh, I was expecting him to be a real bitch. You know, so, so if if they can do that, and and they're after him, and they don't want him seeing me, I, I was expecting him to be just beat to hell. But he wasn't. He was in good shape, and that puzzled me. And I'm like, uh, you know, I, I thought you'd be toast by now. He goes, no, no, I, I did what you're telling me, and I'm able to keep them at bay to some degree. But he didn't push it hard enough to get rid of them, just to kind of keep them under control. He, did, he didn't, he didn't push to get totally rid of them. And uh, you know, we had, we did some small talk, and then I said, "Do you remember the the crackling the last time you were in my office?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah." And I, thought, and I said, "Do you hear that?" He goes, "Yeah, I heard it." And he said, I'm surprised you did. And I said, you know, what the hell was it? He goes, that was them. And I said, the voices? He said, yeah, that was the voices. And I said, um, what were they doing? What the, what the devil were they doing? And he said, they were, they were trying to scare you. And I said, well, they did a damn good job of it. I said, what's the deal? And uh, he said, well, they, they, they were trying to scare you off. And uh, I said, well, they did that. And, uh, you know, I remembered how strange he looked when he, uh, he left my office. And I said, what were they telling you when you left my office? He said, they were telling me to go get a shank and stick it in your belt. Wow. I, I, did, I didn't take that serious because maybe I was, <laughs> because I'm stupid. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, I've been working with this guy for six months. I mean, you know, I know him well. I mean, I know his voices. I know what he's going through. I know his family background. I know his, his, his criminal history. I know all this stuff about him. You know, I, I, I know him. You know, he wouldn't do anything like that. You know, and um, so I asked him, I said, well, why didn't you do it? He said, I couldn't find one. <laughs> 
oh. what the hell am I getting into here? Wow. You know, and, and there's nobody to talk to. I mean, who am I going to talk to? I try to bring this up with my wife, and she goes, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to you got to stop doing that. Keep it up. Yeah. So forget that. You know, then she's going to start thinking I'm a nutcase, too. There was nobody I could talk to. That was the worst of it. You know, here's here's this other world, and and I I see patterns to it, and, and I'm I'm starting to learn how it works, and there's nobody I can talk to about it until I hit the, this book called The Presence of Other Worlds by Wilson Van Dusen, who was a clinical psychologist in one of the state hospitals in California. He was also a, a, a devotee of uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, who was a Christian mystic who lived some 700 years ago, and. Swedenborg was able to, uh, he was one of the top scientists of his day. I mean, he, he was one of the last guys to probably know everything there was to know. He, he was. What he was, was that chief. last one? The, the second name? What was that? Emanuel uh, Swedenborg. Emanuel Swedenborg. I've gone over your playlist so many times, Jerry. It's ridiculous. Sorry, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. Let me, let me just clarify that you have met people that have these voices that are not on pharmaceutical drugs, right? Yeah. Matter of fact, in the ER, none of them were. They'd come in raw. The police would just dump them on us. You know, here's this lunatic in the streets doing this crazy stuff. Here, deal with them. They'd just drop them off and go. You know, in the prison, a lot of times, they were medicated before they got to me. But in the ER, man, they were raw. <laughs> You know, so I spent my last 10 years of my career working in emergency rooms and, and private psych hospitals. Um, so it was trying to figure out how much information I could get to them to help them in the very limited amount of time that I had. How much, what could they absorb of what I knew that would give them some chance of recovery? Um, that became the challenge there. Um, But, uh, yeah, yeah, there was nobody I could talk to about this. So um, there, there was a Swedenborgian church here in Tucson. And I, I went there and I got Swedenborg's book, Heaven and Hell, and I read it. And Swedenborg was talking, the, the evil spirits, he was talking about mimicked exactly what these voices were doing and saying to these patients. And then I found out about Van Dusen, who wrote The Presence of Other Worlds, um, and he was talking, carrying on conversations with these voices. So he had one chapter, I think it was chapter seven, where he, he had all these transcripts of where he was carrying on conversations with these voices. Not only the negative ones, but positive ones that his patients were hearing. Um, and the positive ones were talking at a level far beyond what um, the patient himself understood of the conversations that they were having. But he also saw that the negative ones were consistent and negative. Um, and I started carrying on conversations with him for a while also. Um, and they didn't like that. Uh, but it, it was strange because you know, they were telling me stuff like, um, if, we, if we get caught talking to you or, or if, if we get caught and, and the patient realizes that we're not their own thoughts, we get punished. So there's apparently a hierarchy of them. And so, you know, these are the guys that are the foot soldiers that are attacking these guys, but there's a layer over, over them. And, and I actually experienced this once where we got rid of two voices that were plaguing this one guy. And, and I thought, we're done now, you know, he's, he's free. And, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, have a good life. To start moving on a positive spiritual path and stay there. And then all of a sudden, the stronger voice shows up. And I asked him, well, where did that one come from? And he said, well, that's their supervisor. <laughs> so what I found is if you could, in my conversations, what, what they were telling me, that if they don't destroy the individual, they get punished. So they're like assigned to that individual to, to, to bring them down. And I've even heard one case where the, the voice wasn't mean enough, so their supervisor came and took them away and put them in a mean room. Um, but what they do consistently do is they do take the patient's energy, so their emotional parasites. They have to turn the emotional state negative first before they can suck that energy off. So that's why it's consistently negative. 
that's why that what they're telling these people are horrible, you know, be paranoid. This guy's going to kill you. Watch your back. You can't trust your own mother. Don't tell anybody anything. Um, you know, if you tell anybody about us, they'll lock you up and they'll drug you, which, which happens. I mean, you look at the average schizophrenic has no incentive to tell anybody about their voices. What happens? You know, they, 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 they tell their friends, they lose their friends, their friends go, well, you're possessed, something's wrong with you. I mean, normal people don't hear voices, you, you're a weirdo, and they start backing off, and, and then the voices tell them, well, they're not worth anything anyway, don't trust them, don't tell them anything, and, and so they find all their friends leaving, so they tell their parents, and their parents get all upset, and, and, and go, well, you know, and, and then they start acting up in the house and doing stupid things and pissing off their parents and not listening to anything and not taking their meds, and, and, and so they call them before a psychiatrist and tell the, they tell the psychiatrist, well, I'm hearing voices and the psychiatrist said, well, you've got a chemical brain imbalance and, and that's why you're hearing voices and you've got to take these drugs for the rest of your life and, and uh, if you don't, we're going to lock you up. And, 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 Sorry, you know, Terry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Um, no, we're, we're knocking on the top of the second hour now. This is mm. awesome. Um, yeah, it is going fast, but um, I'm, I'm probably going to have to knock off here because it, in the UK it's, it's yeah nearly one o'clock in the morning. But one final question. Um, um, no, it's gone. <laughs> you knew it, Josh. Yeah. It lost me. It it it'll come right. back. It'll come back just as you come back, John. Uh, John so. But yeah, Jerry, we're not going anywhere. John's just in a different There you way. go. It's come back. Don't worry. So for anyone out there that, that was is hearing voices, <laughs> what? How how were you disrupting these voices? How were you stopping them or, or quelling them in some way? Um you know, because I imagine there's quite a few people out there that may have been hearing voices that would never tell anyone, a doctor or anyone even near them, you know, because of the connotations that come with hearing voices. Obviously, you're, you're going to end up in a straight jacket in a padded cell. What, what, would, what advice would you give to anyone who is possibly hearing these voices? Well, in the UK, there are, there are several hearing voices groups where they can talk to scores of other people who hear voices. Oh, wow. So, and they can talk to them. Um, and there's international hearing voices groups that way, too. Uh, so what they, they talk to each other about what the voices are telling them and, and you know, how they cope with them and, and that kind of stuff. The thing is to get the idea across that they are real and, and they're, they're energetic parasites. So the first, first thing is to break the spell of psychiatry and academia. And, and they, they have to understand that these things are real, that they follow a number of fixed, predictable, unswerving patterns, which is not characteristic of any kind of hallucination. So they are not hallucinations. And psychiatry will tell them they are. They're not real. It's all in your head. It's not real. And right. that makes them even more upset because they're kind of going, once, once you attribute the cause to something you can't do anything about and you have to take their meds, their, these expensive toxic meds. Now, I'm not saying that meds are useless. I mean, they're very useful in bringing down the volume of the voices so you can reach the patient with the kind of information we're talking about here. And unless you know how to get rid of them temporarily on, on your own, which most people don't know how to do that, the meds are the only way to calm them down to, to the point where you can reach them. So I'm not saying those meds are totally useless, but they, they shouldn't be used consistently as a treatment. These people have to be taught ways to get rid of them. Um, and to realize that it's not them, it's not their brain, it's not them attacking themselves. These attacks are coming from another source outside themselves. So once that happens, they can. there's a split there. 
And it makes a major difference whether they're attributing these things to them being crazy and their brain having a chemical imbalance and something being wrong with them and their brain to, no, it's it's not my brain. I'm hearing these things. Other people are hearing these things. They're all seeing the same kind of things. They're coming in from outside of me, even though they sound like me. Now, a lot of patients can tell the difference, uh, and a lot can't. So one of the main ways to tell the difference is the intent of that voice. If the intent is negative, it's not you. It's not your thought. Um, Other people can tell by they sound slightly different, and they're male and female ones. You know, some of the female ones are are more vicious than the male ones. Um, Some people experience being touched and and sexually molested by these things. Um, when they really get control and they're no longer afraid of being interfered with, they will move outside of the patient's head and speak to them like from two, three feet outside their head. At that point, that's really upsetting because the patient then knows that it's not them. And here's something talking to them that they've been talking to for a long time now outside their head speaking to them. And they will, they will tell them stuff that there's, there's no way they could know. You know, I had prisoners tell me that when they ran out of meth, and meth is very dangerous. You must see more psychotic, uh, psychotic, psychotic on meth than any other drug. They don't like marijuana because it calms the patient down. They don't want them calmed down. They want them all whipped up. They want them negative and, and in a, in a fury. Um, uh, Jerry, real quick. You know, um, oh, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I've got sort of a sordid history with drugs and alcohol along with uh, an ex-wife who was diagnosed with PTSD and bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. Um, it's a tough lineup. Yeah, boy, tell <laughs> me about it. It's a real tough lineup. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. That was no fun. Um, no, I bet. Are there paranoid schizophrenics that have actually completed a 12-step program that have maybe worked all through all 12 steps? None that I know. You know, the, the 12-step program, is a, it's a very spiritual program. And, mm-hmm. and that's why it works. You know, these, these voices don't want these guys going near anything positive spiritual. They don't like people. They don't like the victim being happy. They don't like them having friends. They don't want them reading any positive spiritual anything. They don't want them going to church. Uh, they don't want them going to uh, 12-step meetings or, or anything else. Yeah. They want them isolated unto themselves where they can attack and generate this negative emotional energy without any change. Yeah, I remember having worked at least a f- the first few easy ones. Um, and just the, the raw vulnerability of writing out every horrible thing you've ever done to anybody that you could possibly remember and just having it laid bare right there for you to see however thick that book is um, and how empowering it is to be able to just cough all that up and just be like oh Jesus that's gross now do I swallow it or spit it out and well, it, 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 that's that's very interesting because that's what these things go after mm-hmm. that garbage that's stuffed in there and, and that's where they're useful. But a lot of schizophrenics don't know how to use that. You know, what they do is they'll attack that kind of stuff that's buried in there, all those horrible things you've done. And they have complete access to your memory. So they'll pull up stuff that you forgot from 20 years ago. And all of a sudden, you'd be walking down the street and go, oh, yeah, you remember that horrible thing you did to this person? Oh, you're such an asshole. Look, you remember that? You know, and you go, where'd that come? I forgot that 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And they'll rub that in your face forever. But what they're doing is showing you that this is stuff that needs to be brought up, digested, worked out, and, and forgiven. You know, so that's where the, the 12 step thing you go and you tell the person and you say, I'm sorry, and, and, and please forgive me and, and then forgive yourself. And then that's no longer food for them. They can no longer go and poke that and bring up negative emotional energy, because when you got to stash that big, they can jump in there and they can they know all that stuff, you know, because they, they like Carlos Casanata said, they give us their minds. So not all your thoughts are your thoughts. Those ones that go down in there and they, they dredge up all this horrible crap that you did in the past and they, they start rubbing it in your face. 
they generate that negative emotional energy with that and they could care less about you. But if you know how to turn that around and go, okay, they found something I forgot about that I need to deal with and I, I need to work through this, digest it, go apologize and forgive myself and, and forgive the other person and, and move on with my life. So that's where they're useful. But you have to know how to use them. And most schizophrenics have no idea. It, there's this, what they call it, a spiritual gravity. So where once they see, sink below a certain point, they can no longer see anything like that. They're, they're, they're just enveloped in darkness and they keep sinking. And these things keep taking more and more control until, you know, I've, I've seen some patients that were totally controlled. Totally. Everything they did, they were now the voices. They, they were now somebody else and they would tell their parents like i'm not i'm not your son anymore i'm joe hicks you know I, you know you're not my parents and this, and this is my house and you get out you know or i'm going to kill you it's completely taken over so they, they strive for more and more and more control they want nothing to do with god they want nothing to do with jesus or, or you know the, the quran and, and, and they call them the jinn over there at the um, Asiatics. So it's the same thing. You know, they're dealing with the same thing. They have prayers that get rid of them. Well, they hate the 23rd Psalm. They can't stand it. But so one of the things I tell them to start with is put a rubber band around their wrist. They have to fight back. They, they can't just sit there and, and let these things kick them. So I started off and when I first realized is give the guy a rubber band, let him, when the voices come, so they're, so they're very slippery. So, you know, they kind of slither in there and take over your mental state and your thinking. And, and if they have, if once they have to hit a certain intensity before they even come to the, the person's attention. When they do, they can snap that rubber band on their wrist and it stings them. And it, it was back in the 20s, a psychiatrist wrote a book, uh, 30 Years Among the Dead. And what he would use would be uh, static electric shocks. And he would shock the patient and, you know, it wasn't like, a, it was like a rug in the winter, you know, you get, you know, static shock. It's, it, it's, it doesn't really hurt that bad, but you can feel it to them. Oh, yeah, I have a Van der Graaff generator and I've been shocked plenty. It doesn't hurt, but it, it wakes you up. Yeah, it gives you a sensation. They don't like that. <laughs> to them, that's like a violent thunderstorm. And they would actually leave the patient. Now, this psychiatrist's wife was a psychic, and she would take the voices and she would walk them into the light and ask for relatives to come and take them away. And once that happened, that voice was gone. And I experimented with that with some of the prisoners, and it did work if they were willing to walk into the light. Not all of them were willing to do that. Um, and, and once that happened, they were gone. But the patient still needs to, to work on that garbage that they have built up in there. Well, yeah, there'll be a new... A new one to come. A new one coming right behind it. Yeah. Right. So, so if you're wow. only using meds or you only use an exorcist that drives out the ones that there, and you don't clean out that, that garbage that's attracting all the flies and the, and the roaches, they're going to come back and they're coming back with more. Just like the Bible said, they'll come back in force and it'll be even harder. And I've seen that and experienced that also. But they are very real. There, there are ways to get rid of them without medications. But the you know, medications are useful in lowering their intensity so you can reach the, the person with the, the methods that we've written about in our book and, and on our, our website. Um, so, so what's the youngest? In the description of the show there, Jerry, the, your site, the book. So they're all there in the description, everybody. Definitely go check it out. There's lots of information on Jerry's website. We, me and Josh have been over there pretty much all week. So yeah, that's jerrymarzinski.com. Sorry, I didn't say it, but yeah, it is linked for sure. Uh, you said earlier about how they do not like people using cannabis. And that's interesting because a lot of folks who have kind of broken out of some of the mind control programs, MK Ultra programs, things like that, that's what they were repeatedly told that, yeah, use any drug you want, encourage meth, encourage amphetamines, but stay away yeah. from marijuana because it. It messes with the mind control, so apparently it, it, works, yeah. it works on the demons well, as well. Yeah, and that's what the voices would say, too. You know, you don't want to be taking these psych meds with all these nasty uh, side effects. You may well take a drug that feels good, you know, they go drink alcohol or use meth. And, and you know, the other thing that I want to warn people about is I've gotten a number of people now that are writing in saying these spirit boxes that they're using 
to talk to, to ghosts and spirits, those spirits are now infesting them and they can't get rid of them. So now they're sure. hearing voices. So their spirit boxes are not harmless toys. Yeah, there's a big thing. I saw a bunch of videos back. I, I, I dug way deep into this a few years ago, and I saw these Dybbuk boxes that people will order and just open as a video, just as a joke, as a laugh. It's got a demon in it. Let's open it and play around. Like, yeah, enjoy Ouija. what comes later. I'm convinced. Ouija boards are another one. I'm going to say Ouija. I'm convinced I picked one up on a Ouija board. Yeah, they're, they're very dangerous. I've talked My to sister-in-law people. has one that's been following her her whole life since the Ouija board at a young teenage age. When you were asking what's the youngest I've heard, well, when I went to the ER and I was in charge of the children's unit in, in the regular hospital, it was amazing how young they were when they were hearing voices. Um, and some of them were like, and I, and I didn't even think that was possible. I thought you had to be, you know, at least a teenager to hear them. No. You know, some of these guys were hearing them at uh, like seven, eight. You know, they were, they were hearing these things. Gosh, I would be yeah. terrifying. So, yeah. Jerry, have you actually heard recently that cannabis is supposed to induce schizophrenia in some people? That this is one of now the dangers of you using and taking? Yeah, and- yeah, that's you know that's the friggin' drug establishment saying you know yeah use our tranquilizers, don't use this stuff. Yeah, this stuff's dangerous. But you look at the side effects on their meds. <laughs> my God, oh yeah, <laughs> liver cancer and and you know insanity, and it could poison you. And you you know they're, 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 you look at those. What's the side effect? I mean, it's like a horror show. You go, why would anybody take all this stuff? They don't want you using that because they want you using their tranquilizers. And stuff. Now, you know, I have seen patients who were on the edge. Okay, so they're they're very unstable. You know, they're, they're real paranoid, and and using some marijuana, especially if it's strong, will will push them over. Okay, they get more paranoid, but it's the exception rather than the rule. And, and the, well, the, yeah. If somebody doesn't smoke pot often and they smoke pot, it, it is. It's like you get paranoid. But yeah. for people who smoke it regularly, those are the people that would be. You know, it wouldn't kick them over the edge. No, no. Yeah. You know, and and the fact that the voices themselves are telling these patients to use anything except marijuana is is telling in and of itself. They don't want them using marijuana. They don't well, want them. The coming. first thing I would go do then, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what I did. You know, take something they don't like, give them a double dose of. It. And like I said, that the only place I could get away with that, I couldn't do that in the ER. I couldn't do that in, in the state hospital. I couldn't do it in prison. You know, we could give them doses of all kinds of stuff they didn't like, and, and these guys, you know, they they get. And, you know, I never had one attack me in the prison. I, mean, I guess the closest I came was that guy who the voices were telling him to go get a shank and, and, and stand me. But you know, they tell me straight up the voices were telling you, telling me to, to beat you up or to leave the office. You know, and they say, "Well, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that." But that's what they're saying. And that was common. I mean, that was like almost every day. So I did hear a story once, sorry, Zach, real quick, about a girl. This is just a story that was, I overheard her telling a group of people, not a big deal. But she was, you know, all tweaked out all weekend, and she was sort of coming down, and she and this guy were just sitting on their couch. And she looked up, and sitting across the room was this large um, sofa-sized mirror. And she could look in the mirror and see these two, like, shadowy figures standing beside, right behind them. As they were sitting on the people. couch, these shadow people, right? Yeah, yeah, they're a whole different deal. They're yeah. a completely different deal. So there's really no correlation between shadow people and the voices. There is. They, they aren't the voices. Okay. They're, they're, they're something else, and and I'm, I, I don't think they're they're good, whatever they are. But uh, you know, um, meth heads see these things constantly, and, and usually they're three dimensional shadows, with without facial features. And the ones that are worse, that's what you saw? When I was eight years old. Did you see the the eyes? No, it popped its head out of my cousin's closet. Mm -hmm. There was a light outside and it, usually it was just the trees. You know, I could see the big branch coming up through the middle and there were some um, tree branches coming off of it. And I noticed this weird looking shadow now. I just woke up in the middle of the night. It was probably like you were saying, three, four o'clock. 
and I looked up and it was looking at something else. And then all of a sudden the shadow like turned his head and just looked right at me. And I closed my eyes instantly. And then when I woke up, I didn't think much of it until the next morning I woke up and I asked my cousin about it. And he said, I don't want to talk about it in the Mm. most serious voice Mm. an eight year old could say. And I knew right then that something was weird. Yeah. Yeah, myth, myth addicts see those a lot. They're common. And and the, the more addicted they are, they start seeing the eyes. Okay. So I mean, actually use that as a clinical diagnostic tool. If they saw the eyes, then they were in much worse shape than somebody who didn't see the eyes. And the eyes were always red or lime green. They were never on any other color in, in both both those colors are kind of spooky for us. Yeah. But these things never spoke. They, they never said anything. And uh, I ran into one, one uh, prisoner who, who, with his friend, went and did an experiment. They wanted to see whether they were both seeing the same shadow people or whether these were independent hallucinations. So they, they got their meth and they were injecting the stuff. And they went out to an Indian reservation out in the desert in the middle of nowhere at night. And uh, one of them injected the mess, <clears throat> and he started seeing them, and, and the other guy didn't. So he's pointing him out in the desert, and he said, you see that one over there? Yeah. No, I don't see him. Well, how about, how about this one? There's one standing right next to you. You see him? No, I don't see him. So the second one injected meth, and then after it took effect, then they started comparing. I mean, you see that one over there by the tree? Yeah, I'll see him. What's he doing? He's doing this. They came to the conclusion that they were seeing the same thing. So here was this independent confirmation that they're both seeing the same ones doing the same things. Now, one thing the prisoners would consistently tell me is, is a lot of them would see these things and then run off. They, they, they'd leave. You know, they didn't want to be around them. They felt that there was something bad about them. But the ones who were curious and stood there and, and looked at them and, and watched them and were, what is that? They'd start moving toward them. They could sense when they were they were being seen, and they'd start moving toward them. That was real scary. So what these two guys said was they were so enthralled with pointing out the different ones and what they were doing and, and surprised that they were both seeing the same thing that they tons of them started coming out of the desert. And they were surrounded by these things, and they were all moving toward them. So when they realized that, they jumped in their truck and locked the doors and rolled up the windows. So they're watching them from inside the truck. And all of a sudden, the, the, the patient, you know, bam, the back of the truck was like somebody dropped a giant boulder in there. It, and it recoiled, and the front went up like some horrendous weight was, was thrown in there. And, uh, and that took me back. And, th- and that was before this other experience. You know, that, that was the first inkling that I had that they could affect physical reality was that guy's report. And uh, I asked him, well, what'd you do? And he said, we, we started the truck and almost wrecked it getting out of there. And I asked him, well, did, did, he, did they follow you? And he said, no. Yeah. So they're out there. Schizophrenics see them. We see them out of the corner of our eyes. Every once in a while, you see something dark out of the corner of your eyes. Yes. And try to focus on it, and then there's nothing there. So we see them. You know, normal people see them periodically. Um, but meth and, and psychosis, are, they see them on a regular basis. You know, earlier you I, talked about one of them mentioning the supervisor. So that kind of speaks towards some type of hierarchy to these beings. And I, so I, I, with, the ahead, voice, with the voices there are, with the shadow people, I, I don't know. I, I've only spoken to one once, and it, it almost scared it, it scared the bejesus out of me. You know, I was trying to get information. I can tell you that story. It was, it was a Christmas Eve, and I was I was in the ER. I was assigned. I didn't want to be there. Um, it, there wasn't much happening. And in comes this meth addict who'd been shooting for 10 years. And, and the whole time he was in the ER before he got to the psychiatrics where I was, he was shaking like a leaf. Just, you know, just couldn't stop shaking, uncontrollable shaking. When he got back to the psychiatrics, he was still shaking. Um, so when I brought him in and I started talking to him about the shadow people, you see the shadow people? Yeah, I, I see him. And I was surprised this guy was still alive. I mean, he should have been dead years ago. I don't know if any of you have been injecting meth for that period of time. You're still alive.
This is interesting. This guy's still alive. And he, he comes to my office shaking like a leaf still. And uh, we started talking about the shadow people. And he goes, yeah, I, I see him. I said, do you see their eyes? Said, yeah, I see their eyes. What color are they? Well, they're either lime green or red. So jived with what I've experienced. Um, I said, I just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm like, have they ever spoken to me? And uh, he said, yeah. And that really got my attention. Because he's the only one that I've ever heard of where they spoke to me. And I asked him, what did they sound like? And he mimicked this high-pitched, squeaky voice that reminded me of squeaking your fingernails on a chalkboard. And, and just, just him trying to mimic it kind of gave me the shivers. And I said, what did they say to you? And um, he started telling me about uh, them telling him to jump in front of traffic. And, and then all of a sudden, he disappears, and his eyes completely change, and, and there was another being staring at me through his eyes. And it was like these two dark pools of black hatred. I had never felt such cold hatred in my life. I mean, it, it was like looking into this infinity of hatred, and, and his shaking went away. He was completely still. And I was staring at this thing, and one of the things I learned long ago is you don't run from these things. You've got to sit there, and as much as you hate it, you've got to sit there and face them down. So I'm sitting there staring at this thing, and it's staring at me, and it was like I could just sense this hatred. And, 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 and it wasn't him any longer. This, this, it was clearly something else looking through his eyes. And, and his eyes actually changed. They got much darker and bigger. And, and that went on for, seemed like an eternity, but it must have been like 10, 15 seconds. And then it just, boom, it blinked off and he came back and he, his eyes were the same again. And, and he was he was shaking, quivering again. And I was like, oh, jeez, man. Yeah. And, uh, and I went on to question him. I'm like, well, what did they say? What did they say? And uh, he said, they told me to go jump in front of traffic, and I wouldn't get hurt. I said, well, what happened? He said, uh, well, I went out to the street, and I jumped in front of two cars. He said, I was hit each time. I was thrown off the road each time. And I woke up, and the, the shadow of people were standing around me saying, get up, you're not hurt. And I said, well, you know, what happened? And uh, he said, well, I got up, and uh, I wasn't hurt both times. And I went to ask him another question and, and then that that thing came again. I mean, he went he went still again and here's these, this, this creature staring at me again with that even more intense hatred. And I'm like, oh my God, not again. And it seemed like a friggin' eternity. And then finally it blinked off and, and, and I went, okay, I've had enough. I can't deal with this anymore. That, that, you know, I, whatever that is, I don't want to deal with it. And so, so I let him go, started writing up my, my psych report. And the psych nurse comes in and she goes, I couldn't deal with that guy. I couldn't even stand him for 20 seconds. What do you got that I can write my report on? Um, but, but that's the only time I've ever spoken to one. And, and it wasn't nice. Is that the only time you actually saw the physical change happen to somebody like that? No, you can see that with alcoholics. I mean, you know, when an alcoholic gets drunk and he starts getting violent, he's not the same guy anymore. You know, that's a common thing. And and with with schizophrenics, when the voices came on, if the person wasn't aware of what was going on, yeah, you can see their patterns change. And I got to where I could actually feel them. I couldn't see them, I couldn't hear them, but it was this icky electrical feeling that I got when I was, toward the end of the time I was working in the prison, and all through the 10 years that I worked in the ERs. You know, I would ask uh, the patient, you know, are you hearing the voices right now? And they go, no, no, I'm not hearing them. And I go, yeah, you are, and this is how strong they are. I can feel them. You know, how many are you hearing? And, and they're like, what? Do you hear them too? How do you know that? You know? So yeah, it was this icky electrical feeling. That, you know, and, and there was one time I was med- meditating on my on my roof one day, and I, I felt that same thing. I'm like, "What's it doing here? I'm not even near the, the ER. I'm, you know, I'm just up on the roof. What? Why are they here? They were fishing. I guess. Hmm. Yeah, it gets stranger and stranger. 
but they, they're out there. They're hitting us all to different degrees. It, it's not like it's just the schizophrenics. I mean, it's a continuum. Every negative thought you have about yourself. The schizophrenics are the ones that have those negative thoughts down in there that they feed on. So they constantly well, they feed on us all. are attacking them. Well, yeah, but the schizophrenics are the ones they attack more. Well, yeah, the they, have more that, contr- they have much more control over them. Yeah. You know, so they, those, it's like uh, they're doing the same thing to the schizophrenics that we do to cows. You know, that you put them out to, for a while, you, you drain them, milk them, put them out to pasture, they eat grass. You put them, bring them back, isolate them, milk them again. And so that's what they're doing to, to, to the schizophrenics. I mean, I'm sure over your time and experience with what you've been doing with these entities, your your name's probably on a few lists out there on the other side. And I'm not being silly. I'm serious because I know a lot of us here in the panel, as we have had our life path of, I won't say, I don't know, awakening, spirituality, whatever you want to call it, as we've come to certain milestones, plateaus, revelations, epiphanies, it always, or at least for me, for sure, and in this group, we've talked about it, it seemed like suddenly a light goes off on a circuit board somewhere and they see you. And now they're here every night, every time you turn around, every time you switch a light off, they're right here and it's almost like they're just screaming. But nobody else is there to see it with you and you're not really hearing it, but you know it's there. And see, when I do do when I deal with all this, I go to a different level with it. I've been doing lucid dreaming and astral projection my whole life, and have dealt with these things on a whole different plane. And that is, I mean, that just seems to be part of it. When they know you are aware of them, they are very aware of you. Yes, so I'm sure that you're on a lot of radars out there. Oh yeah, they've uh, they've done some pretty awful things. Um, yeah, they, they've made my life miserable in a lot of ways. And, and they don't like me doing these kind of broadcasts. You saw they, they completely I, shut down the computer. Yes, they have. And I yes, warned you ahead of time that stuff like that happens all the time. And the thing they don't, they hate most, the thing that riles them up the, the most, the single thing that really drives them crazy is, is when you reveal that they are energetic parasites. They can't stand that. Anytime you want to set them off, man, all you got to do is, is bring that up and they go nuts. And the ER, bam, that would set them off right away. Matter of fact, I'd tell the, the, the patients, that when I found one that I thought could handle this information, you know, I'd ask them, uh, you're hearing the voices right now, and they'd say, no. And I said, well, you will be in about three minutes, and this is what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you, I'm stupid, I'm crazy, don't listen to anything I say. Get out of the office, get away from me, get out of the ER, escape. And if, if you don't do those things, they're going to tell you to attack me. And time after time, once I go to tell them they're energetic parasites, they say, yeah, that already happened. And it happened. And what's so strange is they can't change it. So if, if that's, what, that's what makes me think there's something robotic about them. They're, it's almost like they're all made in the same factory somewhere. They're, they all run the same program. And, and this is a glitch in that program. So, so it's like if, if somebody's telling you guys, hey, you're going to stand on your head in five minutes and, and, and you're going to fall over and break your, break your butt. You know, you're going to go, no, I'm not going to stand on my head and I'm not going to break my butt. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. You, know, you you do something to prove that guy wrong. These things won't change it. All they had to do was do something different. You know, just say something different. But they couldn't change that program. They would say the same thing. Oh, I could predict it, and they would follow through instead of proving me wrong. And then you're, the, you're what you're saying right now has been on my mind a lot here of late. I really know. You, you know, there's bad energy, there's bad dark energy coming from these things, without a doubt. But I do believe, especially after you talked about the hierarchy, the, the, the superintendent, if you will, maybe they're at levels just like we are. You know, we have leaders, we have the elite, we have the controllers. So. Maybe I they're think. just as trapped in their bullshit as we are. And like, like that movie, They Live. I was talking about this this morning on the show. There's a scene where the guy, he just puts the glasses on and the other alien walks up and buys the newspaper that's filled with the same fucking propaganda that we're reading. So why would this creature want the same propaganda it's because they don't see the propaganda in there they're just as wrapped up in it as we are so i think that whole thing of they've got to make this quota this amount of energy this 
Monsters Incorporated. Well, if they, if they don't, they, they, they starve. You know, they, they, if they don't generate that negative emotional energy that they feed off of, they, their energetic state goes way down. Now, the, the creator will feed them. I mean, they won't disappear, but they'll be at a very low energetic state. And being stuck in their script like that, I mean, that sounds very bureaucratic. I mean, anybody here who's worked in a fucking office can tell you there's nothing more soul-sucking and hellish than working in that atmosphere. Yeah, and you know what? I'd ask him about that, too. I said, don't you ever get tired of torturing this guy? I mean, it's the same stuff all the time. You just keep feeding him the same same bullcrap. Don't you ever get bored with that? Oh, yeah, but that's, you know, that's what I have to do. They told me that if I didn't do that, that um, uh, they would, they would, uh, I wouldn't be alive anymore. I, I, I would cease to exist. You know, they told me I didn't have any light in me. And, and I'd say, well, okay, let's go see about that. And, and then I'd, have to, I'd say, here, okay, and I'm talking to the voice now. I'd say, okay, imagine, take a trip with me. Let's go. Let's go look and see if you have any light. And I said, okay, let's get moving. And I'd say, well, you see anything yet? No. no. But do you see it yet? No. Do you see it yet? And oh yeah, I see. I see a dim orange light. And so they told you you didn't have any light in you, and you're seeing light. And they get mad. The voice would get mad that they've been lied to. And I'm like, they're getting mad that they were they were lied to. They're getting mad at their boss because they were lied to. But they did. And I'm like, you know, it's all of a sudden it was like an instant rebellion. They lied to me. And I'm like, okay, what did that? What did that say? Where, where did that go? But, but it helped to walk them into the light once they found they were being lied to. Because they, I'd say, okay, let's, let's go further into the light. And they didn't want to go to it. They, they said, we were taught that if the light would harm us, it would burn us. And it's, well, stick your hand in there and see. Most of them, they do it, and it, it, it wouldn't hurt them. One, guy, one of them said, oh, yeah, it hurts. And I said, no, it doesn't. Stick your hand back in there. And they did. I said, okay, go all the way into the light. And they'd, they'd slowly go in there, and I, they, at first they didn't want to go. And I said, okay, listen, you've revealed who these things are. You've spoken to me. You broke all their rules. If you go back to the way you were, they're going to kick the crap out of you. And there was some place called the pit that they said they would be thrown if they didn't listen to these higher-ups. So if you go back to that and you don't walk into light, you know what you face. They're going to throw you in the pit. Your life is going to be hell. So you either go into that light or these guys are going to make mince me that. So they'd go into the light and I said, okay, now, do you have any deceased relatives that, that, that you can trust? And that's, they'd say, well, yeah, I have an aunt or you know, sometimes it was a dog or an animal. It was strange. I said, okay, call on them to come and, and get you. And that, that person would show up and it, uh, they'd say, okay, my aunt's here. So do you trust her? And goes, yeah. So, okay, well, go with her. You don't want to go back there. And that voice, that, that spirit would go with, with the ant, and that voice would be gone forever. It, it, it's weird, but it, but it happened. It happened over and over. <laughs> but that's, that's really strange stuff. I mean, it, it's uh, maybe th- psychotherapy will get to that point one day. But right now, you know, you go through all this, all four years of psych and four years of psych graduate school and counseling, and they won't mention spiritual anything once. Not once. There's nothing spiritual there. And until no, they have some tried kind to of, remove it from everything. I mean, well, they, they not only dabbled, tried, they succeeded. Yeah. I, I looked into alchemy a lot. I've played around and went back to spagyrics and stuff like that. And in every book I read written by these old alchemists, your intent and all this stuff that you put into it would affect the outcome of how powerful it was and how, and they removed all of that. They, when they made chemistry, they took all of the intent and the, you know, the, you, the, the essence that we put into everything. They took, they stripped it of that, the spirituality side. And you look at the uh, research they're doing with DNA now, They'll take a DNA molecule out of a, uh, a glass of sterile water, and up to three days later, there's a ghost image of that DNA string still in that water. 
So, you know, until they move into the spiritual area, they're not going to understand anything. And the psychiatric and medical mafias, you know, it's all going to be drug down the population and collect as much money from them as we can. And while they're encouraging everybody to be reliant on drugs, they're, these people aren't relying on their own coping skills to deal with stuff. They're taking drugs and they're becoming addicted. And the addiction is horrendous at this point now. So they're doing to, uh, so society a, a huge disservice. You know, they're taking the responsibility for their own lives out of their own hands and putting it in their hands and in the hands of uh, filling them full of these drugs. You know, they're not solving anything with those drugs. Those drugs don't cure. None of those psychiatric drugs cure anything. You know, they're, they're, and they're making a horrendous amount of money. They, they made so much, they bought off the Congress, they, they bought off the medical schools, um, and they're, they're continuing with their false narrative even today. Man, <laughs> sorry. We have a friend who's on the panel, well, he hasn't been for a few weeks now, but he's a pharmacist in England, and uh, yeah, we've had quite a few conversations about the horrors of the... Uh, pharmacological, pharmacological world out there, if you will. Yeah, it's pretty sad that the things that pass from medicine these days. Well, they're, they're actually rotting out these guys' nervous system with these antipsychotic drugs. They're actually destroying their peripheral nervous systems. And you know what they do? When those symptoms start appearing, it's, it's this unsh unshakable adahenia or, or, or shaking. They start quivering. They throw in another drug, um, cogentin to, to calm them down so they don't experience those negative effects as their nervous system is being rotted out so they can they can rot their nervous systems out without them actually experiencing the damage you know, it's it's hideous it's hideous what they're doing I mean, you know, it's a shotgun approach they, they, there is no science to it they, they, you know, the, the guy comes in, you're hearing voices, okay, we'll start you on this drug. It's like a shotgun approach. If that one doesn't work, they try another one. That one doesn't work, they try another one until they get to one that appears to work the best. But they're still, you know, they, they numb your, your, your mind and your spirit. I mean, nobody likes to feel like that. And they're saying that's the only treatment there is. And anything else, like when Dr. Ermach said, hey, at least look at what this medicine man is doing. He's actually curing these people. It's working. And they, they, attack, him to, they attack him to the max. And they just slander him, call him, you know, a traitor and, and, and dragging the, the practice into the Stone Age again. And how could he actually be such a traitor to the academic cause? I mean, it's like, you know. It, it's just sickening what they're doing. Academic hubris. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we see it too much watch. in every yep. aspect of life. <laughs> yeah, true. go ahead, Walt. No, I was going to say, it's really sad when you see it everywhere you look. I mean, not just in this case, but I mean, we deal with, we have with medical, and law, law, politics, and media, right. Everything. Yeah, yeah. You, you look what's going on in politics right now. It's, I mean, it's the same thing. You got all, all these lies being spewed all over the place. It, it's, it's separate, just like the voices do from their families and, the, and their, their husbands and their wives. And the, the voices work actively to break up families and separate people from each other. Oh, the coronavirus, don't get any closer than six feet. You can't go anywhere together. You can't hug each other. You can't talk to each other. You, you, it's the same thing the voices are saying. I, I'm sure it's coming from the same friggin' place you know on a macroscopic level now you know, these guys these these higher up politicians are are full of them and, and you look what's happening in china right now man you talk about biblical biblical happenings i mean they're hitting half of the country is wiped out with these humongous floods they've got bubonic plague you know, broke out up north. They got a grasshopper infestation. They got millions of people without houses and food now. And that Three Gorges Dam is on the verge of breaking. So, you know, it's almost biblical what is happening to them. And, and they're, you know, the Communist Party, they, you can't have anything to do with God or spirit. 
if, if they catch you, you have to write a treatise about why you shouldn't do that. All the churches have been burned. All the What's interesting is the uh, Catholics are negotiating with them about a Chinese version of Catholicism. Oh, my God. And it's not bad enough that they're involved with that sex offense stuff all the way to the, been protecting those guys forever. Now, now they're moving in with the communists who don't believe in God and punish you with anyone who does. I mean, where's this all going? It's insane. It's just nuts. Um, could maybe these be their alien inv- invasion that they talk about? These are like beings that are taking over people so much that they've become the people. Well, I mean, that's kind of what happens with the voices. If they get control, they're no longer the person who was there. You know, they're somebody else, especially if, if they believe that those voices are who they are. And that's what the voices want to convince them of. You know, and I've had dozens of them. Yes, the voices, who are you? And the response they got back consistently was, we are you. So as long as they can keep them believing that, then the, they believe that that's who they are. And they start doing these crazy things that get them in trouble and in prison and, and isolated and, and, and generate all this negative emotional energy. They're, they're active with everybody. It's, it's, a, it's a continuum with the highest concentration with the schizophrenics and then all the way down to just regular folks like us and being hit with them periodically. Well, we've become just a, a your food source, a food, a super fertile food source right now. Thinking about what it is that perpetuates addiction, the shame, the fear, the guilt, all those things that keep that cycle going, and all the whispers of the voices in the heads of these poor people that have to live with this every single day. Yeah, that's a hog trough for them. And the prisons are another hog trough. You talk about generating negative emotional energy. Those things are like the, the smorgasbord of the universe, the prisons. Yeah, and the exact can, opposite of what they should be. Yes. You know, prisons should be full of love and understanding no. and forgiveness and things like that. And they are not. They're, there's no way to rehabilitate yourself in one they, of those they, places. No, they don't want they don't want rehabilitation. You know, I designed some cutting edge programs, boy, and they just brought them down. Anybody who tries to do anything good for the prisoners is, is driven out. I mean, they'll sabotage it. They don't want anything good happening in there. And the private prisons are the worst of all. At least the state and federal prisons try to do something for these guys. The private prisons do nothing. No, except, they want except more bars, more blocks. That, more that's prisons. it. You know, as cheap as possible. They don't want to do anything good for them. That nothing that costs them time or, or energy or resources. Nothing. It, it's just to keep them incarcerated. And, and let, you know, let's figure it out yourself. You know, even even they've even blocked AA and NA from coming in there, saying, "Oh, these are these are these guys are felons. They've, they've been in trouble with the law. We can't let them in the prisons." What? <laughs> yes, yes. I've I've wow. run in that over and over and over again. There was one time where I was the uh, volunteer coordinator for the prison, and I would let in, uh, you know, Catholics and, and Muslims and, and Christian Scientists and anybody who had a positive spiritual orientation, you know. Buddhists and, and, and the, the, the Christian mafia in there, these you know, rabid fundamentalists went to the warden and complained, said, well, he's letting in all these other guys. So, you know, well, yeah, yeah, people are at different levels to be able to see different things, not just your point of view. And, and the, I was relieved of that position. Wow. Um, wow. So, yeah, they, the, the prison, something has to be done there because that, they're releasing these guys I've seen them release guys that I knew they were going to kill somebody in six months and they were done their time. So that, that's it. Okay, they're done. They, they got to go. So if somebody escapes from prison and the mainstream media gets on there and goes, yeah, you're all going to die. There's a murder loose in your neighborhood. You better lock your doors and get your guns, man. You have to worry about it. You can't get your kids inside. There's some, they're releasing these guys every day, 25, 30 of them into the community and a lot worse than the guy that escaped. They've done their time. Oh, here's 50 bucks. Get out of here. Go, go Yeah, the guy that escaped was trying to get away from these people. Yeah. That they're releasing, probably. Ah. 
Well, now they're releasing and they're done their time. They're done. You know, so, okay, you finished your time. We got to let you go. And they just throw them out with 50 bucks. That's it. Nowhere to go. No halfway houses. You know, go survive somewhere. No, really, that's, the recidivism rates are as high as 75%. You know, it's, 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 it's a plague on society. You know, it, it, it's a very damaging, dangerous organization. So do you think these beings could actually be in control of well, in control our society? Of, well, well, it's a battle right now. <laughs> There's a huge battle going on over here, and they're being exposed by Trump at a, at a, a rate like never before. John F. Kennedy was, was murdered for much less than what Trump is exposing right now. <laughs> So he's, 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 yeah, we've arrested all these child molesters and these guys are involved with all this criminal stuff and we're investigating and it's here. We found, you know, and he's exposing all that. They tried to kill him 25 times already, if not more. They would have had him if he didn't have his own private security force. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, JFK if, didn't. They pulled his. Yep. Yep. And then they pulled away the, uh, yeah, away from his car too, the Secret mm-hmm. Service. So they would have got past the Secret Service and got Trump. But Trump's got the military behind him. You know, he's got a big faction of the military behind him. So he's, he's so far, he's been able to stay one step ahead. Um, if he doesn't get back in, man, we're done. We're done. I've been seeing lots of uh, police, uh, even county commissioners, port authority, all different types of sheriffs even, getting arrested and losing their seats of power because yep. of these body cams now. There is an army of people out there going through every body cam footage, you know, second by second, and just pointing out all the bad things that these officers are doing. And well, the, de- the Democrats want to take those body cameras away. So there's oh, no I'm way, sure. You know, they've, yeah. they've been hammered at that forever now. And, and now they're defunding the police over here. The Democrats are defunding the police. A billion dollars out of the budget for New York City, and the crime rate has already soared. Uh, police and New York City policemen are retiring at a horrendous rate. The rest of them are getting sick of the, dealing with this stuff and going into other areas. Um, they've defunded the police, and all, all the democratic states are, are defunding the police and pushing this Antifa stuff, you know, which is total pandemonium and funded by Soros, you know, and, and other bad actors. They, they, they're they're yeah. shooting for pandemonium. Well, you saw what happened in Seattle. They had a murder up there, and they tried to call 911. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. are you serious? You you got rid of the police. You don't, don't have any police now. You don't yeah, get to call nine one one. And in Minnesota now, <laughs> all the damage that was done to their city. Now they're begging Trump for federal funds to re- to repair all the damage these morons have done to their city. And Trump is going, "You got to be kidding! You're the ones that left them in there. You're the ones that pulled the police back. You're the ones that called the called the police off and said they couldn't respond. Deal with it yourself." So yeah, it's it, there's there's a huge battle between good and evil going on right now, and it's it's horrendous. I mean, it's just absolutely horrendous what's happening right now. Never have has the dark side been exposed to the extent that it is right now, and that all the child molesters and sex trafficking and, and movie stars are involved with this stuff, and politicians and the Jeffrey Epstein. It's all all of being exposed for people to see for the very first time. This has been going on forever. And this is the very first time it's being brought out into the daylight. And, and they're pointing at it and said, look at what's happening here. Look at the dark side of society. Look at what these politicians and movie stars are doing. Look, look at what's happening behind your backs. And do you want this? Is this the kind of society you want? And no yeah, you say this has been going on for a very long time. Yes. It brings up one of my favorite quotes from Plato. Those, and especially after tonight's conversation, this just kind of gave me chills. But those able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture will never be understood, let alone believed by the masses. Yeah. Yeah. And that never became more prevalent than it has after this conversation about the right. shadows. And yeah. Well, you know, that's where I'm at, and that's where Trump's at. You know, it's both of us trying to bring out what is actually happening for people to wake up. And, and people are waking up. They're waking up at a horrendous rate. 
you know, for the first time, they're seeing all this stuff. Now that they, now that it's coming to light, but the mainstream media controls all the media over here except for Fox News, and they're making they're encroaching on on that. But, but the mainstream media is completely controlled by the deep state over here. I mean, they're just constant lies, time after time after time. And Trump will point them out. Yeah, they're lying about this. Here's the, here's the truth. It doesn't matter. You know, they come up with another lie the, the, the next day and just put it out there. And they're, oh, well, we must have got that wrong. And, and it's one after another. But people are starting to wake up to that. You know, they, yeah, that they, television is a great weapon, isn't it? Oh, geez. They just have, they can say anything and people will believe it because it comes off that little rectangle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people that what they do is keep keep people in poverty, um, busy. Uh, the average guy comes home tired from work all day. He's got a family, a house. He's got stuff he's got to do. You know, he eats. He turns on the television, looks at the mainstream media news, gets his dose of propaganda, and he goes, "Oh yeah, man, look what Trump's doing. He's horrible." And then uh, uh, goes to sleep, believing that Trump's a, a complete, you know. Uh, and, and doesn't look past. He can't look past because that's, that the mainstream media, unless he goes to YouTube or something like the X twenty two report. And, yeah, he and, did, doesn't have time for that though. Doesn't have time to do the research himself. And the deep state are keeping people in that state where they don't have time to do their own research. That they're just trusting what the mainstream media is saying, and they've brainwashed virtually all the country after country after country. I've been trying to find it for the last week. It was a director of the CIA. I believe it was from the 50s. It was in black and white. And he said, we will have completed our mission when the, um, everything the American people believe is wrong. <laughs> I believe that. And then, you know, one of the psychiatrists was saying, yeah, we, we need to take over religion. We, we need to take over uh, schools. We need to take over, you know, that uh, in all these things they wanted to take over so they would have the power to run things. And, and you see what they're doing, all these made up mental illnesses and, and, and the, the deep state is using this. Oh yeah, you're crazy, man. You don't believe what we're saying. You know, yeah. We'll send you to psychiatrist Joe Blow and he's going to deal to commit you because you're a nutcase. You don't believe what we're saying. You're taking a, a different view than we have. Yeah. We, we'll lock you up for a while until you're full of drugs, shut you up. It's been abused over and over and over. And psychiatry has way, way too much power that they do not deserve. And, it, and it's all an illusion. All, every single one of those mental illnesses, like I said, it's totally made up. It's fabricated. Totally fabricated. It's, it's like a new priesthood. Yeah, exactly. It reminds me of the Egyptian priesthood. And they're scarfing up more and more power, and, and the drug companies are giving them that power. Prior to uh, the coming on of these these antipsychotic drugs, they were the stepchild of neurology. And they were like, you know, get out of our face. We don't want to even deal with you. But once once these drugs came out, man, they just latched onto those, and, and they're like the, uh, the the puppets of of the of big pharma. And they get yeah, all kinds I learned- of drugs. I learned at a young age, my, uh, one of my middle school history teachers, oh, I can't remember his name now. I can see him. Smith, Bernie Smith. He, um, he was a lobbyist. And that's the only reason I learned about lobbyists in school, because he was one and he would brag about it to us. He'd sit there and grab his suspenders and put his arms behind his head and talk about how he took out this politician and would give them whatever they wanted. If they wanted, you know, if they wanted to go have fun over here, or if they wanted to go gamble or this, we just took them out and spent a lot of money on them and showed them a really good time. And they would vote the way we wanted to. And I was like, isn't that bribery? He's like, no, there's a law that says that it's legal. So it's yeah. okay. The, the drug companies had one of the biggest lobbies in, in Congress. I mean, they got people there all the time hammering on these guys. And so so they, they get away with, I mean, you can go, like I said, you can go across the border to Mexico and pay a small fraction of the amount for these same drugs made by the same companies across the border. But they're milking U.S. citizens at a horrendous rate because we, we have more money than these other countries. You can't even bring those drugs over from Canada anymore. You know, they... they they demand that the prices are so high. Look at this Remdesivir stuff for the for this virus. What is it? Three thousand dollars for for a 
one package of the, that stuff where this chloroquinicin is what 15 15 dollars a package or something like that they don't want that they want you paying three thousand dollars the drug companies are totally out of control they want everybody drug silly and everybody should be taking a, a 10 drugs by the time they're 50 and if, the, if you're not they're shocked i think this is it there may be a lot of the older generations that are I see a lot of younger people not buying this. Good. It's pretty much what I'm saying. I'm I'm thinking this is going to wake up more people by doing this. So it's it's kind of backfiring I think on I don't think people are going to look at the medical industry now with all this stuff they're saying and be like we don't trust you at all. Well, there is they can't even I, agree amongst each other anymore. But it's not the entire medical industry. I mean, you've got surgery, uh, you, you've got, you know, all these uh, things. But when it comes to drugs, you know, you, you got to be real careful, especially with psychiatric drugs. And I remember a psychiatrist telling me that most of the, the effect of these psychiatric drugs is the placebo effect of the patient believing that that drug is going to do something. And I remember asking him, I said, well, you know, if that's the case, why spend all the money on these drugs? And just give them a sugar pill and tell them it's going to do this. And he goes, no, 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 no. If they find out, if they found that out, then the drugs wouldn't work at all. And, and I, here's a psychiatrist telling me this. This was the head of, he was the chief psychiatrist in the, in the unit where I worked at the state hospital. And I'm like, whoa, you know. And the same thing with uh, antidepressant drugs. You know, a lot of it is is the placebo effect, the belief that that drug works. So here's all these fancy drug commercials, you know, where they show you the person laughing and, and back to normal and everything. I mean, it's all, a lot of it is perception. It's what, what they can get the person to believe. And they know that. Yeah, belief is a very powerful thing. Indeed it is. Unfortunately, I did experience that too many times with my mother. I would go over there to Oregon and get her off of a handful, literally. Like once, there were 20 pills, 20 pills that she was yeah. taking. And I got yeah. her down to one in cannabis when I left Oregon. And Good for you. She sat there in the chair and let the TV convince her she needed whatever and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the next thing, she's got seven or eight going, and then it's 10. And then it's like, well, they're going right back where you were. If you keep yeah, yeah, you, you look what they're doing. They're actually selling illness. You know, they come on and they go, if you have any of these symptoms, you know, you've got this thing and we got the drug to treat it. You know, and it's like, yeah, everybody's got their symptoms. Yeah. You know, and then it's one thing after another, after another. It's just a, a huge scam and they're making a fortune doing it and they're getting away with it. And they have such deep pockets. A lawsuit's nothing to them. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, we paid out a few million dollars here and there, but they're making they're making billions. You know. $3.7 billion a year just on any psychotic drugs alone that don't cure anything, that, that merely suppress psychotic symptoms because they got this psychiatrist trained in the schools, brainwashed by the drug companies, that this is the only treatment there is. And if you try anything else, you're quack and fool. Well, Jerry, let me ask you this. I mean, we're hitting the three-hour mark. I don't want to keep you here all night. You've, you've dealt with a lot, you've seen a lot, you've experienced a lot with this. Is, is there something that you would like kind of give to the folks who are listening, who may be dealing with this, with family, with friends, with themselves who don't know what to do? I mean, I know you're, you know, you can't diagnose somebody over the air. I'm just saying, as a general idea, obviously stay away from the freaking pharmacy industry, but where would you tell them to go? Where, what resources do they have to go to figure this thing out for themselves to help themselves through this? Well, uh, again, I think one of the, one of the first places they should go to is uh, one of the many hearing voices groups that they're, they're national and they're international. Um, and, and you could do a search on those. That I know England has a number of them. We have a number of them here where, where people are, able to speak about these things and they don't have to hold them in all the time and feel like freaks. You know, here's, here's people that are suffering the same thing with the same kind of consequences and the voices are telling them the same bad things and, and they can, they can actually release you know, uh, some of that and they're not alone. So, so that would be number one. If, if, you know, 
family support is huge. You know, if they don't have family support, and, and the voices are going to do everything possible to break the victim away from the family and their friends. But if that support breaks, their chances of recovering are much less. So they, they got to hang in there with them. If they don't know anything else to do, um, you know, get our book, visit our website. There's lots of things that can be done. There's, there's different things that, that interfere with the pattern these voices run. Uh, but you have to take a stand against them. You can't just lay down and let them kick it. You have to fight back. You have to say, uh, you know, I'm not going to deal with, with you. I'm, I'm going to fight back. I'm not going to. Are you familiar with hearing-voices.org? Is that one no, you know? No, it's, it's just, it's the first one that popped up when I did the search. I, I did, it seems pretty big, but usually you don't want to go with the first one. I just didn't know if you might know them offhand. Uh, no, I got, I got a, a listing of the, one of the ones here. In, uh, well, just get that to us. You don't have to worry about it right now on the show. Get it to us, and I'll make sure and include it in the show description so that anybody who is listening and looking for those sources, yeah, those resources, we, will have them noted there. Just, just do a search on hearing voices groups. So they're national. They're international. They're you know. They're, they're Absolutely. Like I said, I see a whole list here. I just went with yeah. the first one that came up. And there's, there's plenty. And just get into one. Um, you know, if, if, if you don't know that these things are real, that, that they are entities and they, they suck negative emotion out of you. Anything that they tell you bad about yourself or anybody else, that's them. That's the negative voices speaking. And they hit everybody, not just, not just schizophrenics. You know, they're more easily seen in schizophrenics, but they hit everybody. Anybody who loses their temper, that's them that work. Any, any negative thoughts you have about yourself or somebody else, that's them. It's not you. you know, people have to realize that not all their thoughts belong to them. They come from other places. And these things insert thoughts into your thought stream, and they sound just like your thoughts, but it's not your intention. And, and, and they hate loving relationships. They, they hate positivity. They um, they're there. Just be aware they're there because they're not hallucinations like psychiatry tells you. And, and they have no research to back that whatsoever. They won't even listen to these patients who've been trying to tell them otherwise for two centuries. And they're just closed-minded. And, and, and schizophrenics just stop talking to them. You know, they just give me the medicine and, and leave me out of here. There's, you know, it's, it, it's a spiritual battle. It, the medical system cannot fathom a disease or an illness that is this large that has no physical cause and has no physical cure. They just can't wrap their heads around something like that. They've been taught ever since, you know, hip Greek days that there is a physical cause, there is a physical cure for everything, and that that physical cure lies in drugs. You know, how many, how many cases of cancer have mysteriously disappeared? Um, you know, how many how many schizophrenics have been cured by using these uh, these tactics and, and and actually draining the voices until they were so weak they were non-existent? I mean, there are other cures than drugs, and they don't want that out. And they do not want that out because they're free. This stuff is free. You do it yourself. You just you know. Yeah, you can kinda, grow it in your backyard. You can go yeah, find it in the woods. That's it's right. There. That's right. They won't make any money off of that. They don't like that. You know, a free tour. They're making three dollars. That was one of Rockefeller's big pushes when he figured out that he could sell you know pharmaceutical drugs. petroleum yeah. was to demonize the whole herbal backyard, my mom, my grandmother, all of them. We'd go looking for things in the woods that would fix whatever, and all that went out the window. You know? Yep, yep. They're, yeah, they're, they're all dude. quacks. They're all, you know, crazy, stupid deadbeats. So, so, you know, if they're not making money off it, they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, the only four-letter word I don't say is weed. Because every single one of the plants out there growing in your yard has a purpose and a use and is probably more nutritious than half the plants growing in your garden. The big, colorful, pretty ones with all that taste and flavor. Your dandelions, your sorrels, your clovers. These things are so good for you. You're, there's, there's a whole ton of them all across the country in different regions. You can find wild edible food that's probably growing in your yard. 
They don't want you knowing that either, do they? No, no, they'll give you something to kill it. I mean, that grass that you can't eat grow. Imagine all the homeowners associations. Yeah. They found out that dandelion tea actually did something for COVID. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks uh, Thanks for helping me get this information Man, out. Thank you, Jerry. It, you know, it definitely was beyond measure man i mean i know you have more that you could share with us and we could stay here another four hours with you <laughs> yeah easily, we could so. like, this is only scratch the surface right right well man look you you are welcome to come back i know you're a busy guy so you have my email you have our email there and now you have my cell phone because i texted you earlier when we lost you so <laughs> just let us know truly man let us know when you want to come hang out because as you say it's as laid back as it gets we usually have a few more people here i think a lot of what you're talking about is being suppressed in all kind of electronic ways we've dealt with it as well here in our show many times so i don't doubt it man there's so much about this that needs to get out there especially right now when all this fear and all this negativity is being thrown at us so yeah thank you for keeping this positivity out there and thank you for sharing it with us well, you're, you're welcome. I th- you know, I get a lot of good feedback with people saying, thank you, thank you. I finally know what's going on. I can see it now. I'm, I'm you know, waking up. I, I know what's going on with me. At least I know what's happening. And, I, you know, I just ran into a, like I told you earlier, he's a licensed therapist in New York who was hearing voices himself. And he heard both the negative and the positive ones. So I'm, I might talk to him about coming on and uh, – you can question him about how how those work. That would be fascinating. That's great, man. Amazing. Yeah, I think that'd be another real interesting show. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, yeah, I haven't heard of too many people talking about positive ones coming through. The positive ones usually come through in intuition and feeling and um, kind of like an urging. They they don't come out and just speak and barge in like the negative ones do. Um, that still quiet voice. It's still a quiet voice, and these 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 ones, these negative ones, just totally overrule them. They just blow them. You can't hear them past all the noise. So, well, as I said earlier, I've included the links in the show description, guys. If you're suffering with any of this, or, or I mean, you may not even think you are, but just those negative thoughts that are going on right now with all the crap they're heaping at us. Go check out jerrymazinski.com. Go check out the book. Yeah, here's, lots here's of info. the lots the book of info there. They can get it on Amazon, and, and it'll take you all through this stuff. You know? An amazing journey into the psychic mind. The psychotic mind. I love psychotic it. Psychotic mind. <laughs> I'm not sure that does a whole lot of good for the psychic mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the voices won't like them reading this either. You know, so. <laughs> It, it families, it'll help families a lot. It'll help them understand what's going on with their loved ones. I'll also drop a link there in the description for just anybody who might be dealing with it nightly, astrally, lucidly. I know it's out there. I deal with it. It, it comes in waves, and I know right now it's pretty intense. So I'll drop another link there in the uh, show description. I'll wait till we get out of here and wrap that up and put it in after the fact. Okay. Yeah. When you get this out, please send me a link and I'll tell oh, absolutely. it on our website too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank no, you, Jerry. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Yeah. yeah and I'll talk to this other fellow and, and see if he's, he'll be willing to come on at some time in the future. Thank you, man. I'll keep my own email. We are definitely, as you say, it takes us a minute to get to the email sometime, but we will definitely stay in touch. And you have my cell phone. So. Okay. Let us know. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry Mazinski, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You guys are welcome. Thanks for having me. Anytime. (laughs) Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You guys too. Oh, man. That was everything I hoped it would be. (laughs) That was awesome. Wow. Just a totally new insight into all of that. Right, that's what I was about to say. After so many years of dealing and seeing and experiencing and talking with people who deal and see and experience, and this guy was in the battlefield of it, 35 years of, like, front line. So it's very gratifying to know that it's getting out there in the uh, more academic levels, I guess. So, yeah. 
Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, this was the guy in the trenches telling his story, not the general from the office telling you how the battle went, but from the guy down there in the mud, you know, covered in the worst things you can think of. The guy that went through that battle did 30, like in the worst places you could think of. That's where he hung out to meet these people so he could acquire this information and this knowledge. Right. And it's everybody amazing. in chat is saying, thank you, Jerry. I was going to tell him you guys were all excited and thanking him, and we just got too excited telling him bye. So he'll see all that when he gets through the replay. Of the show. Love you guys in chat. It was amazing. Oh, I see. Uh, Jerry, is he flat? Well, no, not technically. However, we all had this idea. I think Zach said it first of maybe getting him to kind of look in to this idea just to get a perspective of someone who's had all of his years of psychiatric psychiatric experience. Um, well, yeah, this has got to be something because it's doing it on such a mass, right. you know, right. that psychiatrists should be interested in this topic. I think the seed might have got planted earlier when we were talking about how when John science about and, science yeah. and religion versus the pharmacology, you know, that idea of the religion side of it. I, I think that may have been the first seed planted right there. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. For sure, he doesn't have to be flat to come over here and hang out with us and talk about this amazing topic. I love that we have Jerry Marzinski booking guests for us now. How cool is and that? And now i got to write a new... <laughs> The avenue for more information so but yeah I'd love love to see his take on this at some point in the future once we uh have indoctrinated him no i'm being silly but once he's had time to kind of really look at it because i mean just like anyone who's seeing this for the first time I'm like what do you even know you know it, it's a knee-jerk topic we all know it so. well we had don and david on and right? it's one of those things that once you can ex- appreciate Basically, that everything you are taught fundamentally was either a lie or wrong or at least flawed in some way. And when you can go back and look at it just to try to verify that source information and realize, oh, shit, none of that source information is there. Most of it's gone and not even it doesn't exist. At best, it's all just made up or just ignored. Oh, this is the source information, but guess what? Nope. <laughs> We're just going to completely turn it on its head and run with it in the other direction. Turns out ionospheres are cool. <laughs> I'll get more into that for sure. <laughs> it's three hours, 13 minutes, dude. I am ready. Yeah, I'll open this top to top on this thing right now. Let's see what we got here. All right. So this is like the bonus. If there's ever been a bonus feature for an amazing episode, this is it. I mean, it like I feel like the kid that's been waiting all day for the freezer pops. <laughs> I'm ready. I don't know. I don't know if I should do it real fast so I can get a good view of it or do it slow so the atmosphere doesn't disturb it too much. I don't know. So do I'm it just open it fast. Do it. Do okay, it, I'll midway. Do it. <laughs> midway. <laughs> Oh, it's already. Ta-da! Never mind. Nothing. And a little sphere, hemisphere in there. Oh, no. I'm going to have to do it only at a few hours. I'll do it again next week so we can try and. Yeah. yeah. It does um, kind of arc up in there, though. No, Can't I can't really see, see it. it. It's so bit. foggy. Yeah, I see the clear spot, like right as you angle it. I see it right above the magnet, but it's yeah. not like. Wasn't it more egg-like when you did it? They showed it to John. Yeah, when I yeah when I only did it a few hours, it was way more. I did it like three or so four. So maybe hours. those gases start compressing enough from the cold. Or those are stars right there, frozen bubbles of something. A oh. lot of those. I don't know. I'll have to. Uh, I'm gonna put it back in the freezer for now. Frozen bubbles of better luck next time. Yeah. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Well, that was a whole two days of waiting for well, nothing. Yeah. Space is hard. <laughs> yes, science. 
No, I'm definitely cool because that means I can just wait Thank three, four hours, right six there. hours, do it, do it a lot quicker. Everybody be looking for live Zach tomorrow on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Where can we That's on good it? times for all. It's G U D T I M S, the number four A L L. If you don't know, you should. Yeah, there's nothing happening over there. Don't worry about it. I know. I went to my channel yesterday to find something, and it was like, man, this is so sad that it's just sitting here not doing anything anymore. I used to at least go put promos or something there every now and again just to kind of keep it going. Because, I mean, there was amazing people coming and commenting and. Just spend too much time did you see the pictures with you guys did you see those pictures of the water thing spout were you here the two inch water spout that i flashed yeah around. with the little weird little yeah. yeah 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 oh yeah okay i just want to make sure you saw this i thought you were talking about i just went completely forgot about this josh somewhere near you is a place where there are three water pipes somewhere outside of st louis Three. I'll say near you. What do these I mean, water I, pipes pertain to? Like, is it? I think I saw the golden. I mean, I think I'm pretty much I saw the arch in the background of two or three of those shots. So it's okay. Be somewhere. So when you say water pipes, are you talking like really tall cylindrical water towers? Really that slim like, water yeah, towers? Like, yeah, water Just towers. Like, right. it's like, like, like a column. towers. Okay. One of them does, and yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I saw UAP put uh, a video out about them yesterday. Or they, well, maybe I saw it yesterday. Not bad. It could be out there for a year. I've been down the rabbit hole again. Daz got me all well, Martin and Daz. And yeah, so when I found out they were close to you, it was like, dude, you need to get over there and check it out. Yeah, I could do that. No problem. I don't know how close I can get. I don't actually think I've ever driven up. One of them looked like it was literally well, right in the middle of the right street. Right in the middle of the street. Yeah, I guess right. the traffic does go by on either side. Right. So it's like, hey, go, go touch it. Go take some pictures. So, I'm sure we yeah, can get there's, it at some point. There's a cave on an island right off the coast of Ohio. I forget the name of the island, but it's got the biggest... You, it's a geode, <laughs> and you go and walk inside of this thing, and it's a giant geode. Like three foot crystals pictures. sticking all over the place around you. And crazy crap like that. Have I traveled yeah. into the future? Am I like, has Yellowstone super volcano exploded? <laughs> Is that our Mandela already happens? Not yet. The coast of Ohio. Well, yeah. North. Because then you have Canada right across the lake. That land coast. Gotcha. That's a big lake. You can call it the coast of Ohio. You know? <laughs> Which one's that? That's Huron. Like Huron. It's, it's a long one. It goes the whole length of Ohio. I think. That'll do. Maybe. It's real shallow, though. Only 20 feet deep in the middle. And it's a little channel. They have, like, little roadways that go through it. And then it's, like, eight to four feet deep everywhere else. It's weird. That is weird. Well, I just went back over to chat to tell everybody goodbye and love you guys. And thank you all. And Christine Mose in chat tells us that she'll catch up later on what you missed. Apparently, James True was live. Oh, damn, son of a bitch. We oh. were live. That does explain a little bit. Jeez. It's Friday night. <laughs> I guess there's nobody going to be live on a Friday night. Yeah, I guess I'll go live since nobody else is live. It's cool, James. I'll be calling you later. No, James <laughs> message. You, 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 you don't got to come hang out. You just got to yeah, keep. Did you authorize that, Walt? He didn't ask. He didn't ask. I will say, he didn't have <laughs> if it was cool for him to go. No, I'm just kidding, dude. I just that was funny when I saw that in chat. I was like, oh, well, that's sort of what. Yeah, it's all right. Everybody will well, catch it on the replay. They'll catch it on the replay, and I'll definitely be pushing it because man, this has been some mind-blowing stuff all right let's quit yep yep and i'm sure john i'm just like spinning in his trailer so <laughs> in the shed so let's get off of here before he has a little puppy or something all the right bust. we don't want to freak out poor mr savage Savage. love y'all again jerry Mzinski, thank you thank you thank you brother come back and we can't wait to get in touch with the friend whose name is already gone because I didn't write it down and it was just too much excitement but please get in touch with us you have our email and you have my telephone so, thank you everybody in chat thank you everybody this morning thank you all the scouts who 
where y'all at I'm just kidding we love y'all y'all come see us love 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 yes we do it does make for a long day trying to catch us first thing in the morning over there on Truth Frequency Radio TFRlive.com for the Ironworks every Tuesday and Friday morning that is 4 a.m. Central to 6 a.m. 10 a.m. to noon Greenwich Mean Time in the meantime you can find us right here on YouTube every Friday for Have No Sphere which has been an absolute blast and we shall catch you next week have a great weekend stay cool be good be well bye bye